City. I'm Sean Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolios. We are tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right. We've got a busy show for you this Tuesday morning. Of course, some big themes that we're going to be tracking. Of course, the stock futures falling after a losing day on Wall Street. The rally is going to be put to the test as investors get more clarity on potential rate cuts. We'll hear more Fed fodder from Vice Chair, Fed Vice Chair Michael Barr later this afternoon. And Fed Chair Jay Powell is set to kick off two days of testimony on Capitol Hill Wednesday. There was one way that I summarized this in alliteration for folks out there. We're tracking Bitcoin bullishness out there as well. And then additionally, the bullseye in the market. We'll get to there all that. There we go. We got jam-packed a couple of days for you, but let's kick it off with what we are also seeing here on the political realm because we have potentially market-moving events in focus this week. Voters in 15 U.S. states are heading to the polls on this Super Tuesday. Now, President Biden is going to deliver his State of the Union address on Thursday. And we're also going to cap the week with the jobs report that's out Friday. So let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know. Your roadmap for the trading day, Yahoo Finance's job. Josh Schaefer, Brian Sazi, and Jared Blickery have more. Hey, Shauna, cracks are starting to form in MAG7 stocks as investors debate whether the historic big tech rally still has room to run. The Nasdaq falling further from record territory, dragged lower by a decline in Apple and Tesla. Apple retreating after a report shows iPhone sales in China dropped 24% in the first six weeks of this year. The recent declines in these tech stocks have reignited the debate. Is this simply market froth? rather than a full-on bubble. Target share is jumping this morning. The retailer blew away fourth quarter profit estimates on the back of $500 million in cost cuts last year, although sales were under pressure again due to more cautious U.S. shoppers. Target CEO Brian Cornell tells me his chain has some big things planned for the year ahead, while the company's COO reveals some details on a coming rival to Amazon Prime. Look out, Amazon. Thank you, Brian. And Bitcoin close to making history once again. The largest cryptocurrency briefly touching 68,000 overnight. The price of Bitcoin now hovering just above 67,000 and change inching closer toward its all time record high. Getting to our top story of the day, cracks forming in the Magnificent Seven. The seven largest tech stocks by market cap have accounted for about half of S&P 500 gains so far this year, but we're seeing some weakness in the rally as investors question whether or not markets are in an AI-fueled bubble. This morning, we're seeing shares of Apple and Tesla pull back on weakness out of China. A report from CounterPoint Research reveals Apple sales in China fell 24% in the first six weeks of the year. And Tesla shares extending Monday's losses this morning on disappointing vehicle shipment numbers out of its Giga Shanghai factory. Of course, as we're watching where there is concentration, even among those MAG-7, we've heard some new terms tossed around in the Fantastic Four, but it's really just kind of a realignment in terms of the concentration, even now within the MAG-7 that we're seeing earlier this year. It certainly is, and Brad, we're going to be speaking with B BTIG's uh, John uh, Krinsky here later on in the show. He, and he's focused on the divergence that yeah. we're seeing the performance of the QQQ, which tracks uh, the, the NASDAQ 100 and a lot of those larger cap tech names, and then some of the magnificent seven stocks that are underperforming, specifically Apple and what we have seen from that company year to day compared to the broader move to the upside that we've seen in the NASDAQ 100. So this divergence has really become the narrative on the street as Wall Street is out there, analysts debating whether or not the recent rally that we have seen in tech stocks, whether or not they have room to run. And th there are some common issues here when you at least look at the two underperformers since the start of the year with Tesla and Apple. Both of those stocks under pressure once again this morning and for the same reason that has been plaguing these two stocks over the last several months and that is weakness out of China. Yes, we had the China sales number drag on Tesla yesterday was one of the worst performers within the S&P yesterday and then we had the news out today, the latest numbers out or the latest reports of numbers out on the iPhone sales. That is dragging Apple stock lower here in the pre-market. So year to date you're looking at 
at that underperformance with Apple off just about 9%. Then taking a look at the one-year performance, a bit of a different picture. So a lot of the focus here on this debate is what we have seen since the start of the year and whether or not that outperformance within Apple and Tesla that we got accustomed to in 2023 is now in the rearview mirror. Yeah, one of the huge things we're going to be tracking over the course of this week as well is, and especially within that China uh, type of kind of thread that we're tracking here, is the quarterly results, I think, coming out of Broadcom, too. That's going to be amazingly important, and here's why. That's one of the companies, if you look up, S&P 500 companies that actually have the largest exposure on a revenue basis to China. Broadcom sits at the very top of that list, followed by Intel. You've got Applied Material and LAM Research as well. So all of these things considered in what we're seeing with China, and it could be a differing as well here in terms of the consumer environment in China and what they're buying into. You mentioned handsets, you mentioned vehicles even, and both of those impacting Apple and Tesla versus some of the B2B sales on the chip side. And that's where we're going to get a little bit more of on the semiconductor space, a little bit more of a read through out of what those purchase agreements are looking like out of the Asia Pacific region with Broadcom to this week. Also, let's pivot to the bullseye here. Target hits a bullseye this earnings season. Retailer posting a big profit beat in its quarterly results. Cautious consumer spending more this holiday quarter thanks to lower markdowns and shares. They are up by 9.5% on the results this morning here pre-market. Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi here to break down the quarter for us. Hey, All right, thanks, guys. Why are you seeing stock, uh, shares of Target really rip higher here? It, the takeaway early, early going is that Target is a better run retailer compared to one year ago. The company's inventory fell 12% year over year. They stripped out $500 million in costs from their cost model last year. Those are good things. Margins were up. But important to note, this was another quarter where a cautious consumer continued to pressure sales for Target. And I caught up with Target COO Michael Fidelke. He talked to me about those pressured sales and what the company has planned. And even within our fourth quarter, where, to be clear, we're not satisfied with the top line. We won't be satisfied until we see strong positive comps. That's what we expect to deliver in 2024. Uh, I hear, Michael, uh, I know the team over there is not uh, really enthusiastic about down sales. The key for Target stock to work and what the market is pricing in this morning is return to growth. Now, I also caught up with Target Chairman and CEO Brian Cornell. He says, Brian, we are going back to growth mode this year. I put that question to Fidelki, and he said, guys, it might take into the middle of this year for sales to pivot. Of course, Target will be uh, comping uh, lower sales or just going up easier against, against easier sales comparisons versus last year when sales were declined. So just by extension of that, maybe a little better consumer mindset, sales should start to be growing into the holiday shopping season. So that's good. All that said, uh, I'm over earnings already. I think the big story is what this company presents at their New York City Investor Day later today. I would be on the lookout for uh, them opening up a, a large number of new super center stores. Mm. Cornell and Fidelke didn't want to front run me uh, or front run their news by telling me how many stores they plan to open up. But an early theme from uh, retailer earnings, uh, these companies are back to opening stores. Uh, but also this Amazon Prime killer. Now, I, I wouldn't say it's going to be a killer, and I would actually be concerned on how Target can stay competitive in this environment. Looking across the landscape, Shauna, we talked to uh, Walmart CFO John David Rady on the day where they made a big deal for Vizio. Uh, Walmart Plus is a program that is out there. It has got off to a very good start. Walmart has content, has a tie up with Paramount Plus, has the same day delivery, and now is about to have Vizio. You look at Costco, you pay for membership each month, you get amazingly low prices. And of course, Amazon Prime, uh, amazing delivery servers, content, assortments of other things you get under Amazon Prime, discounts at Whole Foods, which is a favorite for me. So I think Target really has to come out here at this Investor Day later today because there's a lot of enthusiasm on this plan. Uh, maybe Target charges $100 a year. Whatever it is, they have to deliver more than just getting people to pay up for some form of membership to get products to your door quicker. Yeah, I'm curious, Ozzy, because you, you, we have all talked about this in the past, just why hasn't Target come out with a product like this earlier, right? There's been lots of talk about the fact that this could really be a driver here in sales in the long run. I'm curious, though, and I know a lot of this is just speculation at this point, but from the analyst notes that you, I know you have read very thoroughly over the last <laughs> several quarters, and now that we actually have this announcement, right, what is expected to be included? And do, I guess how big will it really move the needle when it comes to sales? In well, the I'm glad you asked that because I used to be an analyst covering retail stocks. So let me get into my head. On a day like this, I'm thinking, hmm, Costco raking in millions of dollars on membership fee income. <laughs> Target's going to do the same. Or he's going to blow out of the water for the next 20 years, whatever it is. Well, slow your roll. Uh, that doesn't have necessarily how this works. This, uh, there's a lot of competition for memberships. And if you have an Amazon Prime membership, do you want to pay for a Target? And do you want to give up your Costco membership to pay for a Target membership? I think very important for Target to have true success 
here to deliver a, a scaled up membership program where they're charging people real money each year, $100, $50, whatever it is, they have to do more than just offer great same day delivery services. Do I get a free Starbucks coffee? What is the rewards, the overall value equation look like for a program like this? Because if they don't, it's gonna fall flat on its face. All right, you heard it here first, but Sals, I do agree with you. They ha it has to be in those incentives. You have to make a reason in order to subscribe to Target because so many people are already, and I'm one of those people, I love my Amazon Prime. It's it, going to be hard to give it up. If this program offers me free energy drinks at Target, I'm down. I'm signing up today. <laughs> today I'm signing up for All it. the Celsius you could drink, Sazi, will be the first customer here for that membership plan. All right. Sazi, thanks so much for breaking that down. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Make sure to stick around. We've got Brian Sazi's conversation with Michael Fidelki. He's Target's Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer. It's coming up later on this morning, 940 a.m. Eastern Time. You won't want to miss that. All right, well, the NASDAQ 100 future is edging a bit lower this morning. The Magnificent 7 stocks moving in a number of directions here. Tesla and Apple trading to the downside. You're looking at some pressure here. NVIDIA, though, continuing its upward trajectory. So what does this tell us about the market rally and where we go from here? We want to bring in Craig Johnson. He's Piper Sandler's managing director. Craig, it's great to have you here. So the big debate right now on Wall Street, whether or not the massive rally that we've seen in tech, if it still has room to run or if we're starting to see a bubble form. What do you think? Well, what we've been publishing and what we've been talking about is that this is a market that needs to ultimately sort of digest some of these gains. And what we've been talking about is that this market enters an HLTR or a high level trading range where we end up consolidating. And we think that this sort of consolidation is a normal sort of price action that you see, not only after having a very big run in the market coming out of Q4 of last year, but also what you typically see in election years. Markets end up consolidating ahead of elections. And again, we think that'll probably be the case. And then in terms of the MAG-7, they pushed, they've had a very uh, strong run, of course, but the MAG-7 is really now the Fantastic Four, as you're not seeing as many of those stocks like Apple, as you've mentioned, and also uh, Tesla. They're no longer participating along with Alphabet. So this is a market that needs to pause and consolidate but again, we think can still move higher throughout the end of the year. So what are the fantastic four that traders, investors out there should be focusing in on? Well, I think you gotta continue to focus in on Microsoft. They're still doing very well. Amazon is still doing well. NVIDIA is still uh, constructive and pushing higher. You know, out of those sort of three names right there, they still are participating, still doing well. And, and from my perspective, until we see some sort of break in NVIDIA, which has been sort of a single stock selection for a lot of people in this market right now, we need to see that stock sort of stay in this uptrend, stay above its 50-day moving average. And if it does, that's terrific. But again, it's been a big winner. It is probably due for some profit taking, but until you start to see the sell off, I would stay patient with it, hold the position. Craig, what about the fact that so much of the market's gains here over the last 18 months, driven by only a handful of stocks? We talk a lot about that concentration, the risk that that can potentially uh, pretend here for the broader market. What's your read on that, given where levels and valuations currently are? Well, we, we look at this sort of concentrated market. It's been great. It's pushed everything higher. That being said, we think the MAG-7 is going to become the LAG-7 as they're going to end up consolidating in here. And you're starting to see that happen with Apple consolidating and some of these other names. And I think at this point in time, we're going to start to see a broadening out of this market. And this broadening out of this market happens when the market corrects. People take profits out of those MAG-7 or Fantastic Four stocks, and they start coming down cap. That's going to put a floor under this market as it begins to broaden out. But right now... I could take some profits in a lot of those names and just wait for the consolidation to come into play. As I've written in our most recent uh, publication we put out, I think it's more likely to have a 10% downside move in this market than the next 10% being up. And so with that type of consolidation or, or even some profit taking to emerge here, what sectors are most prime for rotation into that have been untapped at this point? Well, I don't think there's a lot of people paying really a lot of attention to uh, financials, number one. Uh, there's obviously been some weakness there, but as we go through and you look at all parts of financials, not just the regional banks or the money center banks, but some of the asset managers and some of the asset plays, you continue to see some pretty good looking charts uh, sort of beyond just the banks. So financials would be one area. The second area would be services. 
um, companies like Accenture that will benefit and participate in consulting services for AI, because there's a lot of CEOs that just are not familiar with what's going on with AI or how it's really gonna impact their business. There'll be a lot of consulting work done there. And then lastly, tech outside of the MAG7 still look very good. I often say to people, if you wanna go down cap, trim your Apple and buy IBM because IBM is breaking out of a 14 year base on the charts. And it's uh, looking like it's gonna be a better outperformer than Apple at this point in time. Craig, when you looking ahead to tomorrow and Thursday, what we could hear from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, obviously not expecting to hear anything material in terms of the plans to potentially cut rates. But do you think the market is still being a bit too optimistic with the three rate cuts expected before the end of the year? Three rate cuts is certainly possible. If I go out and look at the world interest rate probabilities, um, that appears to be possible. What is happening though, is you just keep pushing these out a little bit further. Some of the economic prints that have been coming through have been stronger, a little bit more constructive, and hence you're seeing these rate cuts getting pushed out. Three are still doable. In my mind, I kind of think that in the June to July meetings is probably when you get your first cut. And then the question is gonna be, do we get a cut and then a pause? And so that's what everybody's gonna be listening for from the Fed coming up soon. And then also, is there any change in sort of hawkishness? I don't think at this point in time, the Fed can raise rates. I don't think that's even a question. So it's gotta be a cut and a pause or a further push out and then a cut. But right now, three is still reasonable. Craig Johnson, Piper Sandler, Managing Director. Thanks so much for taking the time here with us this morning. Thank you. Certainly. Well, Bitcoin hovering just under $68,000 this morning with all-time highs in sight. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery joins us for a crypto breakdown. Hey, Jared. It's happening, Brad. Finally, Bitcoin about to eclipse its record high, all but in the books right now. Here's the price, 67524 Depends on which exchange you're tracking. Yahoo Finance uses a blended mix of a bunch of different exchanges. And uh, right now, I believe the uh, all-time high is just short of 69000 here are the, the, excuse me, here's the existing record high back in late 2021. And you can see it's been a long time coming here, just over two years, and we are finally at the inflection point. Just want to point out that Ethereum also on its heels, a little bit lower relative to, with, with respect to Bitcoin's relative uh, all-time highs, a little bit lower in Ethereum, but still nevertheless, the five-day gains here in a lot of these tokens are just mind-blowing here. Here's a five-day look, and you're going to see some of the smaller tokens finally showing some signs of green here. Here's Shiba Inu up 141%. We had a little bit of a flash crash overnight. I didn't see it uh, in this blended exchange look that we have here on Yahoo Finance, but nevertheless, that's a report I was seeing. But you know, when you see smaller tokens like this and Dogecoin up 31%, really gives you a flavor for the risk on environment environment that we're in. It's not necessarily a good thing because uh, these things can end very abruptly. But here's micro strategy. Again, this is only over the last five days. It is up 67 and a half percent. That is a heck of a chart right there. And let me just show you what it has done with respect to Bitcoin, because micro strategy could be considered a levered bet on the cryptocurrency. Here's the GBTC Grayscale Bitcoin ETF versus micro strategy. Micro strategy here in Cyan has exploded 87 percent over the last seven days to Grayscale's 30%. I'm just using Grayscale as a proxy for overall Bitcoin. And you can see until recently, uh, they were closely uh, tying to each other, pretty much neck and neck there. Uh, just getting back to our analysis, uh, nice to see some of these other cryptocurrency tokens, especially the smaller one, smaller ones show the light of day, but I think there's gonna be more interest in what's happening with Cardano and uh, Solana. Here's Cardano over the last seven day, or excuse me, intraday, it is up to 0.7699. But everybody's waiting for that Bitcoin 70,000, I think. And then, well, hats off. 100,000, maybe? Maybe. Just maybe, to quote Dr. Seuss. Guys, coming up, <laughs> shares of EV maker Neo trading to the downside this morning after reporting Q4 results. We'll bring you the numbers after the break.
Let's get to some trending tickers on Yahoo Finance. We're tracking shares of NEO ticking to the downside after reporting a steeper than expected adjusted loss per share. The EV maker also forecasting Q1 deliveries between 31,000 and 33,000. That misses estimates of just over 44,000 here. You're taking a look at shares down by about 4.3% pre-market. I think one of the huge things that investors are also trying to wrap their minds around is whether or not one of at least the early adoption peaks for EVs is behind behind us or in the rearview mirror, at least as of right now, this is a company that could be facing some of that normalization. When you think about the even sequential Q3 2023 versus Q4 2023 decline that they saw in deliveries there, so that's down sequentially. You're also looking at this outlook that is down compared to the estimates that were out there. And then largely here, it's going to come back to where this company continues to see an average selling price in an environment where there's a large pricing war that's really been initiated here to try and capture a uh, consumer that that's a little more value conscious at this point, especially at that higher end of some of these car purchases. Yeah, Brad, and also this is a company that's not profitable. When you take a look at the losses here for the last year, they had a loss of another $2.9 billion. So it's an extremely competitive market. They're being forced to lower their prices in order to drive sales. That's pressuring margins. Yes, margins did improve, but they were lower than what the street was looking for. Margin Vehicle margins here, 11.9% in the fourth quarter. Yes, that was up, but it was still a miss of the 13 13.6% that the street was looking for. And Neo's uh, CFO, Stephen Fang, was trying to alleviate some of the fears out there from analysts, from investors on the street, saying that moving into the 2024, they are going to prioritize their business objectives, improve system capabilities, and also optimize cost management. We know the company made moves to uh, within their workforce. They had a about a 10% a workforce reduction that was announced toward the end of last year. They have had some liquidity issues just in terms yeah. of more capital that has been needed to keep a business moving here. So I think it's a couple of things. One, they're running up against more pressure on margins as they need to lower costs. And then two, the fact that demand isn't anywhere near what forecasters had initially anticipated. And we're seeing that not only play out, obviously, in China, but that's also playing out around the world and a huge headwind here for a number of those automakers. All right, let's take a look at another trending ticker that we are watching, and that is GitLab shares sinking in the pre-market off nearly 20% after the company forecasted full year revenue of 725 to 731 million. That was below the street's expectations. Now the company's guidance for adjusted earnings per share also coming in below what the street was looking for, but it might not all be bad news. Just when you're looking at a 20% uh, drop in the stock, you're asking what the heck is going on. But Mizuho, their analyst there that covers the name, was out saying that, yes, this was a bit disappointing regarding the company's guidance, but he's saying it is time to ignore the noise. He believes GitLab is oversold at, the, at these levels and remains confident in the company's ability to grow. He's got a price target of 75 bucks a share. But yes, we are seeing some of that excitement that we've seen play out in shares of GitLab here over the last several months as they disappoint on that guidance. We're seeing a huge impact on shares. Yeah, development security operations platform here. And, and by integrating AI, they're saying, and this can help them really kind of throughout the software development lifecycle, allowing their customers to plan, build, manage, deliver software efficiently here. But it's really going to come back to where the business momentum is moving at this point in time. Q4 revenue grew 33% year over year. They added about 1,900 basis points of non-GAAP operating margin. What's all this mean? For them, that signals consistent execution across the business. It's a larger question as to where within this broader kind of lifespan as well, these milestones are contributing to the broader kind of responsible growth that they've been really trying to um, uh, not just initiate, but continue to message to Wall Street and the analysts covering the stock as well. Yeah, and again, shares have soared just about 45% uh, this year. You take that into account, uh, and that's why we're seeing such a reaction to that disappointing uh, guidance number here out before the bell. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more coming up. We've got the opening bell on Wall Street. We'll be right back.
It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination and here every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking and we've got you covered with our quarter by quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step by step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. All right, just seconds away from the opening bell on Wall Street. Futures are in the red across the board for the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, fractionally as it may be. It's worth tracking here, especially on a time where a lot of the political sphere is going to be focusing in on Super Tuesday. The markets perhaps going you know, to give some attention to that, but more largely perhaps a little bit to uh, Fed Vice Chair Michael Barr to see what he says later on today as well here. There you're taking a look at the opening bell on Wall Street. Oscar Health ringing the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. And then you've got First Trust ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ in Midtown Manhattan. Yeah, that's right. Go press the button. Open the markets. We can't do anything unless you do that. Of course, they open automatically, folks. So uh, at least it doesn't rely on the fate of that man's finger. Anyway, that's the opening bell on Wall Street. Jared Blickery is here at the home base at the Interactive. Jared, what are you watching this morning? As someone pressed the button, we got markets moving here. Uh, Russell 2000 is kind of leading down. It's down about six tenths of a percent. NASDAQ down eight tenths. So actually, that's the leader now to the downside. And the Dow, the least bad off, it is down one quarter of a point. Now, in sector action, we were tracking uh, utilities as one of the leaders yesterday. It's number two today behind staples also have healthcare leading here those are the only three sectors in the green arguably that's a little bit defensive so it seems like kind of a risk off start to the day have to see how it finishes but tech here tech is taking it uh, the biggest hit to the downside that's down about one percent followed by communication services and con uh, consumer discretionary so the mega caps here the three mega cap sectors are getting hit the worst and here's what it looks like in the nasdaq 100 well, NVIDIA, record high, uh, same story, different day, but Apple has been breaking down here. It's down two and a quarter percent. Let's take a look at the recent price action, and I think a three-month chart kind of tells you what you need to eat need to know we were holding 180 and then we slipped down and uh, the next support level got a little bit below that to see where we're going to go next and probably looking at what is that 160 175 we'll have to see there uh, nevertheless let's take a look at their leaders index here and we can see in the forefront well we got some bond action followed by aerospace and defense uh, small oil just barely in the green but looks like Chinese stocks taking the biggest hit to the downside those are down two percent Korean stocks also taking a little bit of a hit, guys. All right, Jared, thanks so much. We'll keep an eye on some of those movers here shortly after the open. But we also want to check in on gold because it's a top trending commodity here on Yahoo Finance. Gold prices hitting an all-time high, rising above $2,100 as investors bet on potential rate cuts soon. Now, our next guest, urging traders to be cautious navigating this landscape. We want to bring in Philip Strebel. He's Blue Line Features Chief Market Strategist joining us now. Philip. It's great to see you again. So here we are with gold prices right around 2100 Now, it is important to point out just in terms of when you adjust it for inflation, gold actually set a, a higher highs when you look back to the 1980s and some of the prices that we have seen in the past. But take into account where we are today, gold just above 2100 Philip, do you think there's more room to the upside? Oh, I think so. We've got a perfect storm brewing at the gold market with opportunities in silver. I mean, we're $150 above the February lows. You've got US and European inflation data that's been weakening in the prospects of the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of England all to have interest rate cuts are rising. So in May, we're expecting about a 23% chance that the Fed will cut rates. You go out to June, it's about a 65% chance. But I really think kind of the details of this gold rally, because if you look when we took off, it was basically Thursday near the closes when gold futures really started to get their legs. And I think that there's another regional bank crisis that's kind of lingering in the background. Since that close on Thursday, New York Bank Corp has been down 38%. And I think that 
the the reality is is that you're seeing this short covering because of the fact that if you do have um, some kind of bank failures, some kind of regional bank risk, you're going to see it pull forward those interest rate cut expectations by the Fed and they'll end up making those cuts a little bit sooner. And in that case, we'd also be apt to keep tabs on any incoming economic data. Is there one particular print that has a more outsized impact on gold as it translates to the rate cut probability? Well, of course, it's going to be the jobs number on Friday. If we see any number that's below 200,000, I think that that will expedite um, you know, the prospects of the interest rate cut. The last number was about 353,000, so it blew the socks off. That's when we saw prices come down. But I know that I believe that some of these seasonal factors have come you know, out of the market here as far as the job market. Yeah, I think that there's significant underinvestment also in the gold market right now. If you look at the ETFs, it's been just nothing but a series of outflows on that market. Even with prices going up, we saw about $155 million in ETF outflows out of the GLD market. Perhaps those were people that bought that recent record high that occurred on a Sunday night into a Monday, and they've been holding on to that. Now we're seeing that rotation out of gold and into Bitcoin. Bitcoin, which is attracting about a billion dollars a week in ETF inflows. And that's what I was just about to ask you, Philip. How much of that gold outflows in the ETFs are we seeing now flow into digital gold? Yeah, I mean, and you know, the reality is, is that I think that there's a place for both physical assets and also digital assets in people's portfolios. I think that it'll help them against, you know, a macroeconomic backdrop here that is starting to waffle a bit. And then also it will help with the purchasing power going forward. So I think it's a play for both portfolios. If you look at when the GLD started about 2004, over the course of the next seven years, those ETF inflows that went into that asset class took gold from $400 an ounce on up to a record high of about $1,850 an ounce. That's why we believe that with the way the ETF is setting up for Bitcoin, we could easily see $100,000 Bitcoin at the end of the year and perhaps two and three years out, $250,000. Philip, what do you think the price of gold looks like a year out? Well, I think we could be easily back up at 2,500. If you go since 1990, within the first 30 days of the first interest rate cut, gold futures on average have had a rally of about 6%. So if you go 6% from here, that's going to be about another $150 higher. So I think 2,500 is a realistic target. The, the key catalyst on the gold market is the timing, the pace, and the depth of the interest rate cuts. The Fed has really two options. They go slower and sooner, starting March, or they got to go faster and later starting in June. And if they do that, that's where things can really get a bit haywire on the gold market. And I think that, again, with the gold-silver ratio sitting around 89.90, that you could see a really aggressive move on silver higher. Since you mentioned silver, what, what's going on with the level of resistance, this, this thick area as you define it, in resistance that's taking place within silver? Well, silver, the range on the upside where we've run, where we started to pump the brakes has really been 24 to 26. Remember, China is one of the largest consumers of not only silver, but also copper. And with solar stocks under significant pressure, they're one of the most heavily shorted sectors in the market. I think that there are some headwinds for the silver market, but like any balloon being held underneath water, eventually when it comes to the surface, it explodes significantly higher. So we do believe that we've captured some key levels of resistance. Just in the last two days, silver has gone through the 50-day moving average, 2332, also above the 200-day moving average at 2402. I would say your key, your line in the sand is going to be that 50-day. If we go back below it, prices could be just rolling over, and this was nothing more than a head fake. On the gold market, your critical level supports 2,100. Below that's going to be the 50-day moving average at 2,055. Phil, so we got to go. Is there one metal that you're tracking that perhaps is annexed to this boom that we've seen in semiconductor demand? Copper market could easily take off to the upside. We could see four dollar, even four fifty copper if China starts doing some stimulus measures. Philip Strebel, who is the Blue Line Futures Chief Market Strategist, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Thanks for having me. Certainly. We're taking a look now at shares of Sonova after 
Morgan Stanley gets cautious on the stock here with more and the details. We've got Yahoo Finances and Nes Ferre. Hey, Nes. Hey, Brad. And Sonova makes money by leasing and loaning solar systems to residential customers. Now, Morgan Stanley analysts downgraded the stock to equal weight from overweight, cut the price target to $14 per share. That's still about 130 percent upside from the current price. With Morgan Stanley analysts saying that there's a large dislocation between Nova's stock price and the value of the company's asset base but a less clear path to realizing that value in the next 12 months. Now, Sonova in its latest quarter posted a deeper loss compared to the prior year, uh, and solar systems, of course, have become more expensive uh, in the face of higher interest rates. So there has been uh, uh, some difficulty, challenges, especially in the residential area when it comes to solar system. Sonova recently announced a stock offering plan, but the CEO then came out and said, look, we're not, which just just in case we aren't going to be tapping into that stock offering plan anytime soon. The company also is turning to automation to be able to grow without having to increase headcount and to keep those costs lower. If we take a look at the stock today, it's down about 2%, but I want to show you a year to date where it's at, and you can see that it's down about 55% year to date. You saw this big fall here. This is after they announced that stock offering plan over a one-year period, you can see that the stock is also down about 63%. So yes, it's been difficult for these renewable energy companies in the face of this higher interest rates, especially if they stay here for longer, guys. Certainly has, and we've seen the pressure across the board. All right, Anas, thanks. Thank you. Well, coming up, a deep dive into Target's latest quarterly results. Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi spoke with Michael Fidelki, Target's Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer. We will bring you that interview next.
Big moment for investors in Target. The discounter blew away fourth quarter profit estimates and will share a lot about its Ford outlook at a key New York City investor day. Let's get to Target COO Michael Fidelki. Michael, great to see you as always. Thank you for joining us. So really strong, positive reaction to what Target had to say. And if I unpack this quarter, Michael, I see sales down, comparable sales down 4.4%, but I see margins up. I see a big earnings beat. Do you think the street is underestimating how serious Target is about taking costs out of its business to improve margins? Well, thanks for having me, Brian. And maybe starting with that fourth quarter, and you hit a couple of these points, but to me, the headlines are first. You know, if you add Q4 to the progress the team's made this year on profit, which was an important goal for us heading into the year, growing operating income by nearly $2 billion this year is a great step forward on, on a line where we had some work to do after last year. But importantly, what we're talking about and what we'll share today is our excitement for the growth in the year to come. And even within our fourth quarter, where to be clear, we're not satisfied with the top line. We won't be satisfied until we see strong positive comps. That's what we expect to deliver in 2024. But within the fourth quarter, we saw some sequential improvement. We saw traffic being relatively stronger than it was earlier in the year. We saw a step forward in our digital business. And importantly, we saw a nice step forward in our discretionary categories. So we're excited to build on that into next year. And the way we drive value over time is with a strong top line and great profit performance. And we're excited to pair those two things in 2024. Michael, Target pulled out, what, $500 million in costs from his business last year. How much costs are there left to pull out of the Target model? Well, one of the things we're excited about, if you look back over the last several years, as we grew faster than we ever intended in the first couple of years of the pandemic. And that scale, going from a 70-some billion dollar retailer to an over $100 billion retailer, brings so many opportunities to take that higher volume and find ways to take out waste, do things more simply. And that's what the teams have been hard at work at. That half a billion dollars in efficiency work this year is a credit to the teams getting after that work in a real way and, and it paying off. And we think there's more runway there. You know, another example of where productivity comes from is great inventory management. And we've really seen that this year with inventories materially down year over year. Important, we had some work to do there after last year, but importantly, our in-stocks are as strong as they've been in years right now. And that too for lower inventories, better in-stocks, so much productivity comes with that. Our stores are more efficient when their back rooms aren't full. Our DCs can be more efficient when they're able to manage just the right amount of product. And our teams have done a wonderful job managing a great inventory position this year. You mentioned that the traffic started to come back. What do you tr attribute that to? I think it's a handful of things. And you know, a lot of what I'm excited about in the business that we'll do even more of next year, I think contributes. You know, There's some things that have worked really well for us for a while a strong drive up business, double digit growth and drive up in Q4, double digit growth and drive up for the year. That's clearly a way to shop that consumers have fallen in love with. And you know we don't just take that for granted, we work every day to make it better. And so this was the first quarter where we had both a full quarter of, we can bring a Starbucks out with your drive up order, you can do returns via drive up and the guest response to those services have been great. When does Tark get back to growth mode for comparable sales. Is that a spring break quarter type thing or we're talking, we're having this conversation for the holiday season in the second half and that's when Target starts growing sales again? Yeah, well, in aggregate for next year, we expect to grow. We've got to do a sales decline in Q1, but I would expect in Q2, three and four, we're, we're returning to growth. And you will still be able to, so the Target, I just want to get back to the cost. Is the Target still two billion in cost out? Yes, uh, we've said in efficiency work over time, we expect two to three billion of sustained efficiency improvement from that work. And we got a great down payment on that progress with a half a billion dollars this year. And again, the theme of that efficiency work, so much of it goes back to growth in two ways. It's the growth we've seen that opens up the efficiency opportunities. And when we do that right, that gives us the fuel to invest in all the things that drive our growth going forward. And we're excited for the investments we'll continue to make in the business. You know, you've heard me say in past conversations, Brian, you know, those investments we make in our team are some of the most important investments we make as a business. They're high returning investments that we know work as hard for us as anything else we do. We'll invest in new stores. We'll invest in remodels. You'll see us bring more Ultas to the market next year. And those investments in growth have served us well over time and we think will in 2024. The last time I talked to you, Michael, inflation was still 
it was still high. It was accelerating, but not the same rates as it was during the height of the pandemic and then, you know, in the early part of last year. But deflation now setting in in a lot of product categories. Are consumers putting that extra item in their basket? Is that what's driving some of the traffic improvement? Well, if we let's step back and look at the consumer. Over the last couple of years, inflation has certainly been stubbornly high, and we know the impact that that's had on American families. If you're shopping for your grocery run and your food and beverage products cost 20 to 30 percent more than they did just a couple of years ago, you know, that's a real pain point for the American consumer. You add that to higher interest rates, and you know we're excited to see inflation start to normalize. We think that's a good thing for the consumer, a consumer that's been remarkably resilient against that tough backdrop. And you know, with our within our business, I think we see some signs of that rebalancing of the consumer spending portfolio with the improvement we saw in our discretionary categories in Q4. What has also been resilient, uh, Michael, it's the big box retail model. A lot of retailers that you compete with, and some I'll call it like a Home Depot, they're back to opening stores uh, at a rate that I think are, is really, come, really is coming as a surprise to many investors. How many stores will you open this year, and will they be in that super center or that large format model? Now, we'll share more about that this morning. But we get really excited about our prospects of opening stores. We opened 21 new targets this year. And to bring a new target to a market that didn't have one before and the guest response we see, uh, that's work we get excited about. Wearing my CFO hat, the returns on those projects look as strong as ever. And you will see us mix more to some of those big box stores where we can bring the entire target experience to a new market. Uh, also, Target's supposed to announce some form of membership program. Uh, what can you share on that front? Yeah, well, more to come in our, in our remarks this morning on some of the specifics. But what I can say is we start with a great foundation. Our Target Circle program with 100 million members has been really valued as a loyalty program by those that participate in it. That kind of free to join, great value brought by Target Circle every day is a fantastic base. But like always, we're listening to the consumer to find ways we can make it better, we can make it easier, we can provide even more value. And so we'll share more today about what our plans look like to take that great starting program and, and make it even better. I imagine what, uh, after you announce this program, Michael, the comparison is going to be right to, to Amazon Prime. How far does Target want to push this? Does it want to get into content? Does it want to get into cloud services? What is Target's lane and how serious you are about taking that Amazon Prime member away? Well, like all things, we're listening to our consumers. How can we make their shopping experience even better? Better. How can we make them fall more in love with Target, with the products we sell, with our own national brands, with the ways to shop that make getting those products easy? And so, you know, that's what you can expect us to pay attention to. You know, we've seen, like I said, a great response to some of those easy ways to shop like drive up. We think we have a real opportunity to capitalize on a strong foundation and our shipped will shop the store and bring it straight to your doorstep that same day offering. And we think there's runway to grow that offering too. Real quickly, Michael, before I let you go, what is it like to go from CFO to COO and how are you spending your days differently? Uh, well, right now I'm wearing both hats and they're both hats that I, I hope I they're paying you wear. double, Michael. I hope they really have doubled your paycheck. The thing that I'm excited about, and you know, my, my finance team would tell you <laughs> this is true, is nothing fills my cup more than spending time with our teams in the field, in our stores, in our distribution centers. And so as I step into you know working with the operations team even more, it's a chance to get to do that day in and day out, even more than I have in the CFO role. And I couldn't be more honored to be leading an incredible team. Well, you're getting an email from me, Michael. After this weekend, I order a Starbucks delivered to my car because I did not realize you had that service. So some feedback from me uh, is definitely coming. But good luck at your investor day. Michael Fidelke, uh, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer of Target. Always good to see you. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brian. All your markets analysis straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live.
Novo Nordisk shares edging lower despite positive results from a new clinical trial finding that Ozempic it helps cut the risk of kidney disease by 24%. Ozempic has been popularized into a weight loss drug, but it is originally a diabetes medication. The new study findings will allow the Danish pharmaceutical company to file for label expansions. They're going to file for those expansions in the U.S. and Europe here. Uh, the company noting that the headline results from the kidney outcome trial flow is what it was called. Um, and the announcement today essentially just follows the decision to stop the trial early due to efficacy. That was announced batched back in October of 2023. Yeah, the reason why we're seeing some pressure on the stock here this morning, you might be scratching your head asking why, it's because those results, a 24% reduction in risk of kidney disease-related events was slightly below what investors' expectations were. This is according to Sid Bank and according to Jefferies, which is why we're seeing some pressure on the stock this morning. But overall, the positive results of this trial here, the fact that it did reduce events by about 24 percent is just the latest here in the indication of this drug, Ozempic, being used beyond type 2 diabetes and being used beyond uh, obesity. So even more use cases for this drug. Obviously, the thought here is that this is going to drive even more demand for Ozempic. And we have seen Ozempic have a real impact on Novo Nordisk shares, just to say the least. It's now the most valuable European uh, company here, Europe's most valuable listed company last year. Shares are up another 20 odd percent, I believe 20, 22 percent since the start of the year. So we have seen a massive rise in the stock. Of course, the focus of analysts on the last earnings call from Nova Dortis was whether or not supply was going to be able to meet demand and what they were doing in order to boost that supply for the long run. So of course, the results like this, you would think, is only going to boost that demand here in the long run going forward for Ozempic. Yeah, Jeffrey's predicting that the GLP-1 market could reach $150 billion by 2030 here. So that's some of the analyst expectation for what we're seeing. And, of course, a few of those companies powering those solutions to the market. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We are about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Stocks are lower, pulling further back from record highs as uncertainty over interest rate cuts and the continued strength of tech stocks brought a note of wariness to the market here. 
Meanwhile, Bitcoin is taking center stage, surging past 68,000, and we'll see if it can hit a new all-time high today here as well. All right, let's take a look at some of those individual trending takers. First up, Alibaba, investing in Chinese AI startup Minimax. Now, this is according to Bloomberg. Minimax has secured funds from Alibaba and other investors at a valuation of over $2.5 billion. Now, Alibaba emulating moves of companies such as Microsoft and betting on artificial intelligence, this being Alibaba's second major deal in the space this year that it's spearheading. You can see the move up just about seven-tenths of a percent. And taking a look on the earnings front, Stitch Fix shares under pressure after the company delivers a wider than expected loss per share in the second quarter. Stitch Fix also slashing its full year outlook while guidance for the third quarter disappoints Wall Street's expectations. And meanwhile, AT&T gets an upgrade from Wolf Research, the firm upgrading the stock to outperform, citing more 5G fiber and cash flow. Now, Wolf Research saying even amidst bad headlines, AT&T is growing its core business, gaining efficiency, and also paying down debt. And taking a look at SoFi, the company announces its intention to offer a $750 million aggregate principal amount of convertible senior notes due 2029. SoFi also intends to grant the initial purchasers an option to buy up to an additional $112.5 million aggregate principal amount of notes here. You're taking a look at shares of SoFi. They are down right now by a little more than 8%. Let's get back to Bitcoin, and Bitcoin, at least up against some of the historical Yahoo Finance data, may have just hit a new all-time high here. We're going to continue to track this as we move on throughout the rest of the day. Some investors looking ahead to the presidential elections, wondering if it'll be a tailwind or a headwind for the cryptocurrencies. We're joined by, we were joined by, rather, Anthony Scaramucci, Skybridge founder and managing partner, who offered his opinion on the matter. Take a listen. Specifically for Bitcoin, I think macro, yes. Uh, because whether you like Mr. Biden or dislike him, he's for the rule of law and he's for the democratic processes of the United States. Let's bring in Ben McMillan, who is the IDX Advisors Chief Investment Officer, to discuss more here. Ben, great to have you here with us. Uh, you heard there from Scaramucci, who he believes is better for crypto. Who do you believe of the candidates is better for crypto, uh, especially as we kind of stare down November after today? Yeah, I, you know, I think at the presidential level, honestly, it's going to matter a lot less than kind of the Super Tuesday um, primaries that we're seeing, you know, play out at the state level. You know, that's where crypto policy has really been, you know, kind of the forefront of the battlefield. You know, that said, I think it's, you know, depending on who you ask, you'll get different answers. I think generally the crypto community probably sees a Trump administration being a little bit more laissez-faire, um, not necessarily, you know, targeting crypto like, you know, uh, a lot of Democrats did in Congress. Um, but on the flip side of that, you know, you've got Biden with, you know, the infrastructure bill, which put a lot of uh, liquidity in, this, in the system, you know, to the extent that, you know, a, a Biden regime, you know, continues to ramp up spending, um, you know, that could obviously be favorable too. But I think if you ask, you know, if you survey most of the crypto industry, they'll probably say that, you know, a Trump administration would be a little bit more laissez-faire and, you know, allow crypto to, you know, flourish a little bit more easily. Ben, I'm curious what you make of the crypto excitement that we're seeing play out right now. You have Bitcoin just below 69,000. Is it different than what we've seen in past runups in Bitcoin? And if so, why? Yeah, I mean, it is different for the very simple reason that now we've got ETFs, you know, so this is this has been a long time coming. And this is something that, you know, groups like us have been talking about for a couple of years now is once you've got, you know, once you have the approval of these spot Bitcoin ETFs, now all of a sudden, it becomes, you know, normal for a lot of investors out there, a lot of advisors. You know, we're going to start seeing Bitcoin allocations pop up in all sorts of, you know, uh, financial advisors model portfolios. You know, as they make plans, now all of a sudden Bitcoin is an easy asset class for them to, um, you know, to put into these portfolios. We'll start seeing it pop up in 401k plans. And so this is this is important because this onboards a whole swath of an audience that otherwise, you know, probably never re would have really touched crypto. Um, you know, if you go back to kind of the, the um, you know, midterms a couple of years ago, it was still largely the domain of, you know, Coinbase, um, you know, buyers and sellers on Coinbase. It was difficult to hold it in, a, your, in something like an IRA or a 401k plan. And, you know, now this is part of the mainstreaming of crypto. So, yeah, this time is different. Now, that said, we can't just, you know, throw caution to the winds as it relates to, you know, the macro regime. Um, I think a big part of the rally continuing is going to be a function like any other risk asset, like tech stocks, for that, for example, is going to be a function of to what degree, you know, the Fed can engineer a quote unquote soft landing. Um, you know, it's looking 
increasingly favorable, but there are some clouds on the horizon that, you know, plenty of others have talked about as it relates to, you know, things like the coming real estate, uh, um, you know, debt refinancing that could be a catalyst for a credit event, et cetera. So there's kind of two things there, you know, the, like I said, Bitcoin, the approval of Bitcoin ETFs is a structural tailwind that I think we're going to see the benefits of for years, but that doesn't mean it's not going to continue to be a volatile ride. And I think in the near term, it's it's uh, what does the macro picture look like? We're likely going to see a new all time high here today for Bitcoin specifically. What is the significance of this all time high versus what we saw in November of 2021? Yeah, I think this time it's, you've got more breadth behind it. You know, I think also when you, you know, back to when you when you look at, um, you know, the political landscape um, in general, I think, you know, politicians were a lot more anti crypto a couple of years ago. You know, the, the kind of the prevailing narrative was it's, you know, only used for money laundering and illicit transactions. You know, that's been proven to be, you know, not only categorically false, but I think more importantly, you started to see more and more politicians come out. And this is you know, in part a function of the, the robust lobbying effort on the crypto community, but more politicians recognize that now this is potentially a source of jobs. This is a source of innovation, which frankly, America at this point in our growth cycle, you know, can't, uh, you know, turn our backs on. And so, it, you know, that coupled with, like I said, kind of this broader, um, you know, landscape of buyers coming into the market from off the sidelines through these ETFs, um, you know, this is a lot stronger tailwind, I think, than we saw um, a couple of years ago at, at all time highs, you know, last time around. Ben, looking ahead to just next month when we're expected to have the Bitcoin halving, how big of a catalyst do you see that being in the near term? Yeah, so the halving has gotten a lot of attention historically, and it has mattered a lot historically. But remember, at this point, um, you know, roughly 95% of all Bitcoins that are ever going to be uh, mined are already in the ecosystem. So the halvings matter less as time goes on. Now, that's not to say it's not going to have, you know, no impact. It's certainly going to have an impact, you know, particularly for the mining community. It is going to, you know, restrict supply that's coming online or the rate of supply that's coming online. So that, you know, just back to economics 101 is, is again, going to uh, provide a nice tailwind for, um, you know, further upside price movement. But again, we're talking about kind of, you know, the next 5% of Bitcoin coming on the market. So I think investors, you know, psychologically are used to price action, you know, being positive, kind of going into the halving and then for several months afterwards. This time around, we also have the, you know, the, the additional catalyst of the Bitcoin ECFs, which is huge. Um, so I, I expect it having to be kind of, you know, moderately accretive, but not nearly as important as it has been historically. Ben, just lastly, while we have you here, we're, we're staring down a record year for elections internationally here with 60 plus countries headed to the ballot boxes for vote. You know, for cryptocurrency, are there specific regions where you believe that the digital currency adoption is on the ballot and Bitcoin or, you know, some of the largest coins out there are, are certainly going to have a, a key time to watch here or perhaps see the most adoption rate thereafter some of those elections and which which regions would you be watching most most notably? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting as it relates to global elections is, you know, El Salvador is a perfect example. You know, here's a small, you know, emerging co economy that just decided to kind of throw in their lot with Bitcoin as a, as a simple kind of set it and forget it de facto currency. And, you know, price appreci appreciation aside, I think that's kind of a compelling model that I would fully expect to see more countries adopt. I could see African countries starting to adopt that model. Others, Latin American uh, economies start to adopt that model. You know, the other thing as it relates to global elections is, again, let's look at Latin America. You know, historically, Venezuela, going all the way back to the very inception of Bitcoin, Venezuelans were big buyers of Bitcoin for obvious reasons. They had to protect against capital controls and hyperinflation at their home currency. To the extent that we start to see, you know, inflation or hyperinflation kind of rear its head in other economies, I think you could start to see politicians, you know, similar to what we've seen in Argentina, that are just you know going in and kind of whacking deficits across the board and ramping up an adoption of Bitcoin. I mean, I, I absolutely, I absolutely think we're going to start to see global central banks buying Bitcoin, you know, in the next five years. Um, you know, as it relates to which regions to keep an eye on. Like I said, I think Africa could be a big adopter of kind of Bitcoin as a de facto uh, kind of central bank. I think in Latin America, you could start to see continuing uh, buying of Bitcoin from a, a um, you know capital con controls and fleeing currency uh, debasement perspective. And then, of course, we can't ignore China. Um, I think CBDCs is the last place for, to keep an eye on. Even here abroad, you know, even here domestically, but you know, China has been a, kind of a prime example of you know a government launching a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, with the explicit goal of controlling their population. 
So there's pros and there's cons. A lot of people are very concerned about CBDCs as it relates uh, to the privacy perspectives. I think those are, you know, uh, you know, important concerns and considerations. And I think that's the third piece of kind of across the globe to keep an eye out is, you know, countries adopting Bitcoin as kind of de facto, you know, currency, you know, citizens using Bitcoin to flee their home currencies, and then countries pushing CBDCs, um, you know, as a mechanism of digital currency and potentially control. Ben McMillan, great to get your insight here. IDX Advisors Chief Investment Officer as we have Bitcoin hovering just above 68,000. Thanks so much, Ben. Well, the biggest primary day of the year, Super Tuesday, kicking off today. Voters in 15 states and one territory will be heading to the polls to vote in presidential primaries. It's bringing Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman to discuss what this means for the market. Rick, how should investors, should investors be making any adjustments to their portfolios at this time? Uh, making no investment, no changes to their investments at the time, at this time, but paying attention because uh, what's ha what's going to happen with Super Tuesday is we're basically just going to jump from the primary elections to the general election, barring any major surprises. And the only possible surprise is that Donald Trump does not end up as the de facto nominee on the Republican side uh, after today. He will probably win. He he won't get enough to actually have the delegates he needs to clinch the nomination, but he's going to be so far ahead that um, many analysts think the only other challenger on the Republican side, Nikki Haley, will basically drop out within the next few days, assuming this goes as planned. And then we have Biden versus Trump, and we're just going to get to the general election sooner than we do in some election years. And I think this is going to start to matter for markets as we get into late summer and fall, which is when, uh, I, I mean, look, everybody's focused on what is the Fed going to do? Um, you know, are stocks overbought? Are they overvalued and so on? But as we get within two, three months of the uh, the election in November, uh, investors are really going to have to start focusing focusing on major differences between um, Trump and Biden. Um, this involves what's going to happen to individual tax cuts that expire at the end of 25. What about the corporate tax rate? What about Trump's trade agenda? He wants to impose more tariffs on imports. So. Uh, for sure, uh, investors are going to be paying attention to this as we get close to the election. And we're going to get to an important step probably this week, which is that we get beyond the primaries into the general election. Rick, I'm curious to get your perspective just on Nikki Haley saying that she's going to stay in this race as long as she is as long as she is competitive. What do you make of her strategy, her influence and what that could ultimately mean for Donald Trump in the long run? Well, no candidate ever says I'm going to drop out if I don't win. <laughs> so they always say that uh, right before they become uncompetitive and they drop out. Um, and, you know, it, it, among other things, it just comes down to money. I mean, nobody wants to fund a candidate who has no ob no obvious chance of winning. So I think Nikki Haley's doing a couple things here. First of all, she's a contingency candidate. If something happens to Trump and th that's more likely than normal, given that he faces these four criminal trials, He's in. Uh, he's 77 years old. Um, who knows if he's going to stay healthy or stay out of jail? Um, so that's one thing. But Nikki Haley is young enough. She is definitely running in 2028. Uh, so you know, she, by by being sort of the last person standing other than Trump, she has set herself up pretty well for for uh, 2028. And then there's a lot of speculation about. What, once she is no longer a Republican candidate, what she, will she do? And the choices she has are she can endorse Trump and basically just get on board, although she has indicated maybe she won't do that. Uh, she could also become a third party candidate, um, which is a rather intriguing scenario, because then you get into this question of um, if she is on the ballot in some states as a third party, who would she take vote, votes from, Trump or uh, Biden? And, and the early guessing is she might um, take more votes from Trump and sort of play the role of a spoiler. Um, or she could just sort of uh, go dark and um, and sit this out without having much to say for the next uh, seven months. So um, she will probably withdraw, but she's still going to be a kind of an interesting wild card factor. All right, Rick, great stuff. Thanks so much for breaking all of that down for us. Of course, we will keep our eyes on the Bye results guys. as they trickle in. All right, thanks, Rick. Well, coming up, super micro shares are in the red following yesterday's surge. You're looking at losses at just about 6.5%. We'll speak to one analyst who has a possible warning about competition next.
Super microcomputers rally has captured investors' attention with shares up over 250% since just the start of the year. Well, the massive rally that we've seen over the last several months, over the last several years, has pushed its market cap from $4.5 billion just over a year ago at the end of 2022 to roughly $60 billion today. And the stock is going to be added to the S&P 500 later this month. Our next guest, though, so with a warning about long term, saying that the company could face some more competition. So what does that mean for the stock price? We want to bring in Matt Bryson. He is Webbush Securities Senior Vice President of Equity Research. It's great to have you here. So many investors out there are watching shares of Supermicrocomputer, watching this massive run up that we've seen in the stock. What do you think of the valuation today? Um, uh, it, it's trading somewhere between uh, 30 and 40 times, depending upon what numbers you use uh, if you're looking at next year's earnings. Uh, so, I mean, obviously that's influenced uh, by the, their exposure to AI and they've done a great job rebranding themselves as the leading provider of AI servers. Um, at the same time, you look at server companies traditionally uh, and they've had valuations that are more in the high single digits, uh, low double digits. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's something of a, of a conundrum in that uh, the question being, uh, one, can AI uh, revenues continue to grow at these levels? And then two, um, is this type of share that they've garnered uh, at the beginning of the generative AI era sustainable? And so with that in mind, uh, delivery upon some of the street's expectations, certainly in question here. What is the likelihood that they can achieve some of those lofty targets that now are priced into the stock and priced into the valuation, as you were mentioning? Yeah, so I, I think in the near term, um, there, there isn't a ton of risk. Uh, so Q1, uh, it wasn't just super micro, or Q4, it wasn't just super micro who was exceeding estimates in AI. You saw the same thing from Dell. Uh, you saw the same thing for some of the Taiwanese ODMs. Um, they all talk to strength in Q2, I mean, in Q1, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think they have visibility in Q2. Uh, backlog was still growing Q, through Q4, even with sales lifting. Um, so I, I think in the near term, um, there is still strong demand. Uh, there is still a shortage of NVIDIA GPUs, um, which means it's hard, hard for share to migrate. Um, and, and so you should get strong revenues and Supermicro should sustain share. In, in my mind, it's more of a question what happens back half of 24 and, and into 25, and, and that's still a bit away. And I'm curious from an analyst perspective how you're looking at this debate on the street of the AI bubble and whether or not some of the names that fall under your coverage are being caught up within some of the hype. Yeah, so I, I mean, certainly um I, you've seen uh, a number of names in the semiconductor space uh see a significant uh, gains in valuation um I, I i think that ai is going to become an underlying platform for technology so like microsoft os like uh ios for for handsets or android for handsets um and, and so I, I think moving forward there's there's a ton of value in, in ai um, and so e even with valuations having lifted, um, it's still worth investing in. I, I think the questions come down to how sustainable uh, are our competitive advantages um, and what's the what's the shift in numbers moving forward. So you look at something like NVIDIA, I think with CUDA, they've created a moat um, and we can argue about whether NVIDIA share can remain at 80 percent or at some point they're closer to 50, 60 percent. But I think there's a history of semiconductor companies who enjoy uh, substantial share within markets, um, and those markets being one or two players, um, like we've seen in compute, where it's been pretty much Intel um, with with a bit of AMD. Um, the question I think with Supermicro is more on the server side of things. You haven't really seen those 60, 70, 80 percent type share uh, market share numbers be sustainable. Um, so historically, Dell uh, has been the market leader, like 30%. So can Supermicro change that paradigm? Um, that I, I, I just don't know. And Matt, there's also the risk of China because you just mentioned AMD, the pressure that shares are under here uh, early this morning on the fact that U.S. officials telling AMD that their chip that they made here to target the Chinese market is actually still too powerful. What's the impact that that is eventually or is having right now on the company's bottom line? 
Yeah, so AMD doesn't really have a ton of share in China. So I, I think as soon as the U.S. started limiting uh, the ability of U.S. companies to um, support China's requirements in terms of getting their, their best chips into China, um, AMD was always going to be a significant advantage or disadvantage. Um, so I, I, I think whether or not they can export um, that, that chip that's uh, already been governed in terms of, in terms of performance, I don't think it matters that much because I don't think they were ever going to get a ton of share in China um, unless US lifted the US lifted restrictions. Um, with NVIDIA, it's a different story, right? NVIDIA has gotten CUDA into China. Uh, again, I think that's a moat. It's hard for companies to move away from NVIDIA once they've chosen it. And, and so for NVIDIA, I, I think it was far more important that they got back into China. Um, and it looks like su they, they successfully have a chip that can ship into China. Now it's just a question of um, you know, what were their, will their share levels look like um, given the restrictions on their ship's performance? Matt, great to get your insights on this, uh, where we're already starting to see perhaps a little bit of profit taking show up in the tape, but still uh, some lofty valuations out there. Matt Bryson, Wedbush Securities, SVP of Equity Research. Thanks so much. And coming up, bad news is piling up for Elon Musk. We'll give you all the details next. We've got a change in the billionaire ranking. Jeff Bezos is back on top at the top spot as the world's richest person unseating Elon Musk. And after Tesla shares a tumbled since the start of the year, now the Amazon founder claiming the number one title again for the first time since 2021. Bezos' net worth is just over $200 billion, while Musk's worth slipped just under $200 billion to $198 billion. This is according to Bloomberg's Billionaire Index. They both still have a heck of a lot of money, but we bring this up because Elon Musk falling from that number one spot, obviously tied to the decline that we've seen in Tesla stock. But, I mean, these are numbers you and I can obviously not even relate to. Yeah, filed this way as good for them, they're still rich. But at the end of the day, I think for some of the pay package that Elon Musk has been in dispute about, of course, now with focus of moving Tesla to Texas from Delaware after shareholders had essentially challenged his pay package of $56 billion, um, saying that it was excessive, uh, certain amount of his wealth, at least right now, tied up in where are the companies that he is either over 
and sleeping on factory floors or has delegated some responsibilities to other top executives. SpaceX comes to mind where they've been able to successfully move um, their company headquarters as well, um, where that is tied into where the company is incorporated and, and the state uh, legislatures there as well. So um, ultimately, we'll see how this continues to impact both of them and the billionaire rich people index out there. And we got Bezos on top, Mark Zuckerberg in fourth place, 179 billion. Bill Gates, not far behind. Not too shabby. 15 million. They're doing well for the themselves. Top five. All right, well, Tesla shares tumbling to new multi week lows on troubles in China, now slowing China shipments and new price cuts in the region, spelling some caution for the year ahead. For more on this, we want to bring in Dan Levy. He is Barclays Senior Autos Analyst. Dan, it's great to see you again. So we've seen the reaction obviously play out in shares over the last two days, concerns about what we're seeing demand-wise in China. Is some of this a bit overdone, or what do you think? Yeah, th thank you, uh, Sean, Brad, for, for having me. Look, I, I think what we're seeing playing out is the, the broader theme that we've been talking about uh, into the year, which is that this is really a year about pivoting from supply constraints to demand constraints. And you're seeing that playing out in the EV market where, you know, and, and, and this is something we've been seeing in the, in the back half of last year, especially where you're seeing some questions on demand. What's the what's the sustainable pace of volume? Um, look, the, the February data for, for Tesla in China was probably impacted by Chinese New Year. So, you know, we, we don't want to look uh, we don't want to focus too much into that. But we are below consensus on, on first quarter uh, deliveries, um, you know, roughly 450,000 units. And, uh, you know, look, in, in addition to, you know, the, the dynamics around Chinese New Year, you have some slowdown in Fremont related to the refresh of, of Model 3. Uh, you have uh, some issues with Berlin production around Red Sea delays. And just broadly, you know, they're sitting on a lot of uh, inventory. And so this, I think, underpins <clears throat> our more uh, a conservative view versus consensus deliveries in, in 2024. We're at roughly 2 million. Consensus is 2.1 million. Just think that you know there's going to be some challenges on meeting some of the consensus numbers. Dan, we we had continued to monitor at least for I want to say a couple of years now a shift in sentiment from some of the consumers within the region towards other homegrown brands and perhaps why BYD has been able to see their own uh, successes within the region skyrocket and move past Tesla. Even how much of it is tied back to that mindset as well? Listen, I think this is a, a key theme in the auto industry. It's it's the rise of, of BYD and some of the other domestic Chinese that have really figured out the cost dynamics. Tesla has actually fared okay in China. You know, they've generally maintained uh, in, in the BEV market, call it high single-digit, low double-digit market share, which is very respectable. Um, it does. Uh, it is obviously below where BYD is, where they've been pacing lately at roughly a quarter of the market. So I think there is still room for Tesla to, to grow volumes, even with BYD doing well. Um, but it is a reminder that you know of the regions where Tesla is competing, you know uh, Europe, U.S., China. China is by far going to be the most competitive and the most intense. We've seen some price cuts lately. And that's where it's, you know, it's a bit trickier for, for Tesla versus other regions. Dan, have we still not seen the worst for Tesla when it comes to the pricing wars and the pressure that that will likely put on stock? Well, uh, there's probably more price cuts coming. This is what we're including in, in our model. Um, our view is that, you know, probably continues for at least the first half of, of the year. We actually have pricing flattening out in the back half of the year. I would say one thing that you've seen change a little bit with Tesla is that as opposed to last year where there were sort of more uh, open and wide price cuts from them, uh, what we've seen really in, in the last, call it, six months is more, I would call it, discrete uh, discounting, other forms of discounting. I think in the U.S., you know, some of the large price cuts that they did last year uh, were maybe not as stimulative of demand. This is why you know, they're constantly facing this question of uh, elasticity of demand because the price cuts really hadn't driven the type of volume that they maybe hoped for. And I think where you're maybe seeing a little bit of a pivot is holding the line a little more on, on pricing rather than the approach last year, which was 
all we care about is volume. Remember the comment from Elon a year ago that we could theoretically sell cars at no profit? And that view has changed that, you know, they're clearly being a little more sensitive around the margin line. Dan, thanks so much for taking the time here today, breaking out some of the key themes that investors are tracking around Tesla and the broader EV landscape. Dan Levy, who is the Barclays Senior Autos Analyst. Appreciate the time. Great. Thank you so much, Brad and Shauna. You got it. Former Twitter executives filing a new lawsuit against Elon Musk and X Corporation, alleging that they are owned, owed, excuse me, close to $130 million in severance. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan to give us the details here. Hey, Alexis. Yeah, so this suit, uh, this dispute, I should say, really arose back when that acquisition was closing, and that was back at the end of 2022 when Musk was acquiring Twitter. But now we're seeing it in, in on paper here, seeing these former executives sue Musk and X Corp uh, and for this severance. They want their severance pay. They say they were deprived of this pay. This is the former CEO, Parag Agarwal, former legal uh, chief, uh, Vijaya Gaday, former CFO, Ned Siegel, and also the former general counsel, Sean Edgett. And they say that they were deprived of their severance when Musk closed the acquisition early, doing kind of a sleight of hand at that transition closing, serving them some termination letters right after he closed that, uh, that early and said that they were no longer entitled to their benefits. Now, these are a RISA claims, that is an employment act that protects uh, retirement plans, basically, for private companies. There are some uh, limits that companies can go to, and these are federally mandated laws where there has to be compliance. Now, the plaintiffs say that there's no facts to support a for-cause termination. That's what Musk did in handing them these letters saying that they were terminated for cause, uh, saying that uh, they did not act in good faith, that there was gross negligence committed, that there was mis willful misconduct committed and uh, kind of alluding in these papers to some vague language according to the plaintiff saying that because they paid success fees to Twitter's lawyers, the former Twitter's lawyers that handled the deal, uh, that that was so, some sort of corporate waste type of behavior. Um, also, in employee retention bonuses that these executives green lighted. But the executives here in the complaint, they say that these actions, these payments were all done at the authorization of Twitter's former board, and so that they were okay to go ahead and do that, that that doesn't amount to misconduct. Now, in the complaint, they say that Musk is carrying out here by withholding this severance a personal vendetta against these executives for trying to push the deal through. Because remember, in the contention around the acquisition when Musk was trying to walk away, these executives were aligned with the shareholders and the companies at that time, at the, in the company that time, trying to make sure that the deal was finalized. Now, in the complaint, they say Musk orchestrated the closing and termination plan as a pretext to cut off severance exact vengeance and save himself money. They also say that at the time he was uh, with having communications with his biographer, Walter Isaacson, and at that time had told Isaacson that he was going to save something to the tune of $200 million by doing this sleight of hand. Now, I'm not saying he would have called it sleight of hand, but sure. that's what the plaintiffs are saying here. Yeah, absolutely. Great uh, dive into this one. Alexis, thanks so much for breaking this one down for us. Alexis Keenan. Well, coming up, cracks are beginning to show between some of the Magnificent Seven stocks. A strategist tells us what this means. Stay tuned.
A rally in big tech has driven the market to record levels, pushing the S&P and the NASDAQ to recent all-time highs. But it's not strength that we're seeing here across the board. Some cracks are starting to form in the Magnificent 7 trade. Invesco's QQQ, the exchange-traded fund that tracks the tech-heavy NASDAQ 100, is up just over 8% since the start of the year. Now, compare that to the underperformance that we've seen in Apple stock, which is off here in negative territory since the start of the year. Here to tell us what that might signal ahead, we want to bring in Jonathan Krinsky. He is BTIG's Managing Director and Chief Market Technician. Uh, Jonathan, it's great to have you here. So what does this signal? Is some sort of shakeout coming? And what do you think that could potentially look like? Yeah, thanks for having me. So, you know, if we take a step back and look at the big picture, um, obviously it's been a, you know, an amazing rally for, for the NASDAQ in general. Um, we've now gone actually over 300 trading days, consecutive trading days without a down two and a half percent day on the NASDAQ 100. Uh, that's the third longest streak since 1990. And so, um, you know, you could say that's a bit of complacency. It's, you know, now on the one hand, it is something you see in strong bull markets. Um, the two longer streaks we saw was were in 2006 and 2014. So when they ended, neither of them marked any sort of major top. Um, but I think the point is that we're, we're certainly overdue for, um, you know, maybe a bit of a shakeout. Um, and then within the NASDAQ 100, we're, we are starting to see um, some dispersion and bifurcation, whereas, you know, last year was pretty much, uh, you know, a uniform move higher for the Magnificent Seven. We've now started to see that break down. Obviously, Tesla has been the weakest link, um, but Apple's, as you mentioned, down about 10% on the year. And recently, uh, Alphabet or Google has started to, to roll over and break below its 200 days. So um, there's some, you know, some dispersion going on. And then, you know, the last point we'd make is, what we noted yesterday to clients was um, a pretty rare setup in the sense that Apple, the daily RSI um, was below 30 yesterday for Apple, while the daily RSI for the NASDAQ 100 was above 65. We've actually never seen that since uh, the inception of the QQQ ETF in 1999. The closest um, analog we have was back in late January 2018, when Apple's RSI got below 35 and the Q's RSI was still above 65. Um, that saw Apple have about an 8% drawdown while the Q's were, QQQ was hitting uh, new highs into the end of January. And then we know that that led to that period known as Volmageddon in um, early February of, of 2018. Yeah, I actually used to sit directly across from the office of Jonathan Jacobs, who came up with the NASDAQ 100, which led to the QQQs, of course, um, and is exactly what you're referencing there. It's, it's really interesting here. One of the things that you put in your note there have been lots of signals over the last few weeks that we haven't seen since either August 2020 tech whale blow off or 2018's Volmageddon. What is the largest signal that investors should be paying close attention to right now? Well, yeah, again, I mean, you can there, there's been um, things such as uh, the volatility index has been rising a bit or or holding firm with a rising market that typically um, signals some sort of uh, inflection point. Um, again, we the, we mentioned the Apple signal. Um, you know, breadth, it's interesting, breadth has actually been broadening. Um, you know, we've seen new high, a new high for the Russell 2000. We've seen areas like materials and energy and um, even REITs start to, to actually act better. So on the one hand, breadth is broadening, which I think is encouraging. And that's something that, you know, investors have been waiting for a while, especially after last year was so dominant. Um, and, and not broad. So on the one hand, that is a good sign. Um, on the other hand, if you look at um, some of the momentum indices or momentum strategies where, you know, it's simply um, buying stocks that have been going up. And, and generally, we, we are proponents of buying momentum. But when it gets to an extreme um, and, and buying just begets momentum and you get some of these very extreme readings we've been getting, um, that's when it gets a little bit concerning. Um, some of the AI semiconductor stocks certainly are exhibiting that. You could even look at some retailers like um, Elf Beauty or Abercrombie that have just been kind of one way to the upside. So at some point, the rubber band does stretch too far, and I think we're kind of at that point for some of these uh, names. Jonathan, is this more indicative of more of a short-term pullback rather than a top that could be forming over the longer term? I think so. I mean, if you think about the fact that we just um, earlier this year or late last year broke above that 4,800 level for the S&P 500. That was, you know, a two year, two years in the making. So typically, if you go two years without any progress, you break out from it. 
um, you're not talking about a major top at that point. So, you know, maybe uh, we do get a pullback and retest that 4,800 level on the S&P, which would probably be a, you know, an attractive entry point. But yeah, I don't, I don't think we're talking about some sort of major top. Obviously, could be, uh, could be wrong there. But again, that that broadening of breadth would argue against that. I think it's more just the near term um, extended nature in some of the some of the isolated pockets of the market. Jonathan Krinsky, BTIG Managing Director and Chief Market Technician. Thanks so much for taking the time here with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, major streaming players attend Morgan Stanley's Technology, Media, and Telecom Conference. Execs from Netflix, Warner Brothers, Discovery, they're divulging the latest in what's next for the streaming giants. For more on this, let's get to Yahoo Finance senior reporter Alexandra Canal. Ali, let's start with WBD, Warner Brothers Discovery oh. here. We just got word that they're going to be cracking down on password sharing here. What did they have to say about that initiative, and, and when can users expect the crackdown to hit accounts? Yes, unfortunately, Yahoo Finance was able to confirm that this password sharing crackdown is happening. Mm. It's going to hit users in the second half of this year before a wider rollout is expected in 2024. Uh, five. And really, this comes on the heels of Netflix's success. I think this is a tale of follow the leader. It's not just Warner Brothers Discovery. Disney is also implementing a crackdown sharing password. We'll see uh, users to Disney Plus and uh, uh, Hulu be hit with that password sharing crackdown this month. And it all comes on the heels of the streaming profitability initiative that really all of these companies are fighting for. WBD did become the first legacy media giant to reach full year streaming profitability. However, that number did come with quite a few caveats. It, the profits were boosted by licensing fees, boosted by pay TV fees from HBO. So it wasn't just pure play streaming. So there's still more room to run here. JB Perrette, he heads WBD's global uh, streaming and gaming division. He talked about this at the conference and he referenced Netflix, Netflix's success and said, even though we're not at the scale of Netflix, this is still an incredible opportunity for our business when you think about boosting revenue. And Overall, subscribers in streaming really slow. I think this is something that we're going to see more and more of across the board. So, you know, unfortunately for the consumer, that just means you can't share your password. And I just got into Sex in the City <laughs> on Max, and now, you know, soon I'm going to have to pay for my own account. Sorry. Uh, I know. That's the thing. It, it's, it's a shame. It's unfortunate for the consumer. I, I, I've always had my own Netflix account, something I'm very proud of. I know, my finally siblings, too. My younger siblings definitely use my parents' login, and they've been upset. <laughs> from the crackdown that's been happening. So Max, just the latest, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. So yeah. when you take a look at Netflix results and what happened as a result of their crackdown. It's all so. profitability. And you would think mm -hmm. more and more are just going to adopt that. All right, Allie, mm -hmm. great stuff, thanks. Thanks. All right, well, coming up, shares of ThreadUp plummeting after reporting fourth quarter results. We're gonna dive into the broader secondhand apparel market. And what the signals about the consumer next.
ticking inflation is helping drive sales of secondhand shops, and ThreadUp is one of the businesses getting a boost here. The company out with quarterly results this morning. Revenue topping the street's expectations. It's up 15% from a year ago, and the thrift retailer sees more growth ahead, revealing it expects the global secondhand market to nearly double and reach $350, $350 billion by 2027. For more on this, we turn to Dylan Carden, who is the William Blair Consumer Research Analyst here. Great to have you here with us this morning, Dylan. Uh, help us both go into the environment here uh, that companies could be beneficiaries of uh, if they are able to kind of strike the right platform tone or at least embrace consumers with the right inventory as well that they would like to see up for resale. Yeah, sure. So it's not it's not overly complicated. You have effectively um, two things going on here. One is that the there's an ever present need for value in the consumer space, right? If you look at effectively the, the rise of the off-price retailers in the last 20, 30 years, um, they've won prim primarily because they offer compelling value to consumers, right? If you look at kind of where inflation and crowding out of spending is in the consumer landscape, right? We're spending increasingly more on healthcare, housing, education, right? So most any other discretionary category is deflationary to flat at best from a pricing standpoint, right? So. If you can offer branded or quality goods at a discount, that tends to be the winning uh, uh, sort of you know equation in retail. The other thing that's happening here, as it relates specifically to thread up in the resale market, is just you've removed the stigma around secondhand goods, right? So historically, there's been sort of a you know a a, a dismissal of secondhand goods as cheap or you know I don't know just stigmatized. So it, by removing that from a younger generation standpoint and offering these branded goods at compelling value, that's why it's sort of a compelling space, so to speak. Dylan, it is still an uncertain macro backdrop, obviously, when you take a look at the economy, the fact that inflation is still high, the fact that we there is still this risk of recession. How big of a challenge is that to a name like ThreadUp, or are they relatively recession-proof compared to some of their rivals outside of the secondhand space? Yeah, I mean, they, they showed in the pandemic that they weren't necessarily macro-proof. Right. I mean, the business collapsed along with any other apparel retailer. And that was simply because they are selling a fair amount of goods for people going into the office or for occasion based. Right. So to the extent that you have a consumer that's making a decision between buying Lululemon at Lululemon or Lululemon at Thread Up, you know, the same discretionary overhang is going to impact this business as much um, as any other. So I, I think it's not counter cyclical. I mean, the best you could say is that potentially it is somewhat more resilient if you get a pure, you know, recessionary kind of environment that's sort of an overhang on 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 discretionary spend and that it was a 20, 30 percent value to what you would otherwise sort of be considering for a like purchase. It's interesting because some of even the companies that you mentioned there in Lululemon, Canada Goose, they're they're all starting their kind of like trade in programs and then allowing some of that inventory for themselves to, to be relisted. And they're just kind of shuffling it under a, a resale or gently used gear uh, like new, I think, is Lululemon's one. And so all that considered, yeah. how does that impact a company like ThreadUp? Well, so. so <laughs> The apparel space is the second most wasteful space when it comes to the environmental impact, right? Only after oil and gas. And so to the extent that, and I know ESG and all of that, the environmental concern on some of this stuff has sort of been pushed to the sidelines more recently, but to the extent that the industry has to show some forward progression uh, and from an environmental footprint standpoint, this that's what's going on there. Right? And, and there's a couple sort of things here, right? If you sell a durable product, right? So luxury and outdoor, you mentioned Canada Goose, right? If your if your product is actually durable in nature such that it can have second lives and be used more than once, you have an opportunity, and, and Patagonia does this, Arteryx does this, to sell it again. Hermes, right? It, it, so you can buy the product back. And there it's actually compelling from an economic standpoint because you're selling the same product two, three, four, you know, multiple times, right? So if you think about sort of the gross margin impact of that, you actually get to sort of pot or you know above 100% gross margin in theory, right? If you sell a good that is less durable in nature, so Gap, right? Basics, right? Everything that thread up effectively targets, you don't stand as good a chance in in doing that. So what what the sort of what thread up is doing now from its resell as a service model is effectively taking advantage of that dynamic, right? That if you are a Gap 
or an Abercrombie or whatever, and you can't you can't rebuy and sell the goods in the same way. Right. The red up sweeps in, says, "Hey, we'll we'll, we'll co-brand a similar type of website, uh, and then you kind of it optically look like you're sort of supporting the second the secondary market." All right, Dylan Cardin, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for hopping on and joining us here this morning. Dylan from sure. uh, William Blair, thanks so much. All right, just about 90 minutes into the trading day, let's do a quick check of the markets. We're still looking at losses. Look at that, the NASDAQ, the underperformer of the three major averages, off just over 1.5%. Many of the tech stocks here that have been leading the charge under pressure today for a second day in a row. That does it for us today on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here. Akigo Fujita has you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow. Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita alongside Rochelle Akufo. Here's what I'm watching at this hour. Target shares soaring, fewer markdowns, and lower shrink costs boosting margins for the retailer. But can the momentum continue? We're going to talk about the key risks ahead for Target stock. And an EV showdown. U.S. car makers facing increased pressure from Chinese EVs. And it's not just about cost. Why current government subsidies and trade restrictions may not be enough to insulate the big three from the competition. And rocketing into space. Rocket Lab eyeing its next launch as the company looks to diversify its offerings. Our conversation with CEO Peter Beck is coming up later this hour. 
Well, first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. Looking at a sell-off here, especially the Dow here currently off more than 240 points, though just off session lows. Also looking at the S&P 500 there, down about 43 points or 0.8 percent. Tech heavy Nasdaq taking the biggest losses so far this morning, down 1.7 or 276 points. That's a far cry from the nearly one in five S&P companies on Monday that saw record highs. But let's also take a look at what's happening with the Treasury market as well, as we are seeing a retreat there in the yields as well. Looking at the five year, currently down 1.7 percent. The 10 year sitting at 414 and the longest term 30-year yield sitting at 428. Wall Street, though, continuing to pull back from records as uncertainty over interest rate cuts and tech stocks brought a note of weariness to markets this week. But that's not discouraging the Bitcoin bulls, the price of the crypto asset briefly hitting a new all-time high. And Rochelle, memories of November 2021 here, mm -hmm. when we think about where the highs have been, it has been a wild swing for Bitcoin when you think about where it went. November 2021 hitting that big record, falling to new lows in November of 2022. And here we are talking about that brief passing of the record here. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing to see where Bitcoin has swung more recently. We had a conversation with Ledger's um, Ian Rogers yesterday saying that this is a very different rally than what we saw back in November of 2021, largely because there's different actors in this space. Obviously, the Bitcoin ETF, which we've been talking about a lot, spot Bitcoin ETF, I should say, certainly a big driver there as well. But there's a lot of big players that are missing that led the rally back in 2021. It's true. A lot of changing dynamics since uh, the last time we saw Bitcoin playing around with these highs. I mean, you mentioned the spot Bitcoin ETF, some of the rally, getting some of these more institutional investors in there, hoping to see a little bit more stability. And of course, we have April's halving event expected in the middle of April there. Um, and that's usually been something of a, of a rallying point as well that we see for, for Bitcoin. Ben Emmons of New Edge Wealth noting that if history is an indicator, Bitcoin could hit the 100,000 to 125,000 range based on some of these previous returns that he saw in people buying Bitcoin in the six Six months leading up to the last halvings that we've seen. And they always do tend to be in an election year. So adding, adding a little extra spice here for Bitcoin investors. But certainly we'll see how long the rally lasts, especially between now and what we see with the halving that will come up in April as well. Yeah, you have to wonder how much of this is about the halving, how much of it is about the inflows that have come through from Bitcoin spot ETFs as well. Either way, we're looking at a new record, at least just very briefly today. And, you know, we should mention, by the way, equity space pulling back today. But you mentioned that the, the records that we saw in so many of these stocks on Monday as well. So a general risk on sentiment that is returned to the markets and that adding to the big rally in Bitcoin as well. Indeed, we'll continue to track that for you here at Yahoo Finance. Let's also shift gears here, looking at Target now, blowing away fourth quarter profit estimates on the back of $500 million in cost cuts last year, although sales were under pressure again due to more cautious shoppers. For more on Target's earnings results, we're joined by Jessica Ramirez, Jane Halley and Associates Senior Research Analyst. Good to have you, Jessica. So there seems to be more headwinds for retailers in this uncertain backdrop. Talk to us about the five biggest risks that you see for Target shareholders. Yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, we've had some, it's mixed results, really, what we've had from Target. But I think there's still a lot of pressure for Target and just in the retail space that's geared towards consumer discretionary. And it's still a very difficult backdrop for the consumer, especially if you look at low income and middle income consumer, there's still a lot of pressures out there that are affecting the way they shop. And you could clearly see that through what we noted, the number of transactions and the average as well, that was down year over year. So again, that I think shows the, the pressure that the customer is still feeling out there. Uh, even with that said, we're seeing a big pop in Target shares today, up nearly 12% right now. Um, at least in the short term here, given some of the headwinds that you just highlighted, where do you think the stock tracks? So I think it's a lot of the strategy that Target has done. Is, again, you know, their cost-cutting savings and just being much more strategic in the way that they run their business. So we know discretionary isn't doing well. That is the majority of their business. They've been leaning more towards beauty categories, 
home essentials, and those are repeat categories. And those, again, the, if you look at the assortment that they drive across those categories, it's very strong. They bring in very niche brands that the consumer is leaning more towards. Again, consumer interest focus. So that has done very well for them. In terms of inventory as well, they really have tracked that to be you know, more tighter and run much more productive assortments, even in the categories where there is difficulty. So we're seeing at, at, at having good inventory and productive inventory, you'll have less promotion. So we track promotions in inventory and pricing, and we've seen that really with promotions, they've been very strategic. So only promoting what isn't moving and keeping full price at what is moving. Uh, yeah, again, the, I think that's the result of what we're seeing in terms of gross margin. Um, so that in short term is positive. And I think even long term, they're just running a very nimble business. Also, we're, we're hearing there's more investments in evolving their omni-channel strategy, which is perfect, continue to have a seamless operation in terms of AI, in terms of store um, productivity. Again, all of those short-term and long-term, I think are great. And that's what really what we like to hear because you do have to continue to evolve your experience and continue to evolve in order to survive climates like this. And you know, when we do have a, a stronger consumer shopping, they'll definitely gain even more off of that. So Jessica, if, as you look at the more budget conscious consumer then, if you're a shareholder, why would say a Target be more appealing than the trying to invest in a Walmart or another retailer? Well, I think with Target, you know, long term, they have always been very consumer centric where we saw the fall at Target, you know, a year ago, a bit more than that was inventory problems. And also they, they were um, a retailer that does tend to lean skew more towards a, the higher income. And it's always a fun place to go. So I think there's just a lot of legs in their business long term and they are set I think they're a very smart, agile business in the way they've run their inventory and just strategy overall. Um, they are one of the first retailers, I think, as an effect of Amazon that invested very heavily in digital very early on. And really, when we were in the pandemic, that really took off. I mean, Omnichannel was excellent for them. They really had the advantage of that. And I think they're gearing up with that again, like I said, you know, with evolving their business. So for the quarters, we have been neutral just because we are very cautious that traffic is down so far across the retail landscape. In this year, I have seen traffic to be down in January and February. I think the target is not um, not part of uh, is part of that as well. Sorry. Um, but again, long term, if we're evolving the business and we do see all of this traffic come back, they will be winners. Jessica, that's an interesting take because, you know, we've heard from so many analysts that Walmart, because it's a little more diversified, especially on the grocery side, is maybe better positioned in the face of consumers turning a little more cautious. When you look at these two particular names, um, which do you like better? In terms of this current moment, because Walmart does have more staples in its grocery, we do like that story. Again, they also do offer value with a lot of grocer, and that is key right now with the consumer as a priority of why they're shopping the way they're shopping and again pulling away from discretionary i think long term when that consumer does come back to discretionary target does have a much stronger assortment and it's been known for that fun play you know today they they talked about it on their call you know you can't go into target without just buying one thing you come out with so many other bits and they add that fun so again once that consumer does come back long term i do really like target I, again for the climate that we're in now, as long as there is still inflation and food, and that is still a major concern for that lower budget cu customer, Walmart does have a, a favorable point. Jessica Ramirez, uh, Jane Holleyan, Associate Senior Research Analyst. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, time now for a trending ticker. Many users unable to use Facebook, Instagram, and threads today as a worldwide outage at Meta is affecting the social media platforms. The company's internal systems are also down, according to some reports. And Rochelle, um, Facebook spokesperson Andy Stone, taking to Twitter, saying that we are aware of people having trouble accessing some of our services, and we're working on this now. The reports of that outage, by the way, um, first coming through around 10 a.m. Eastern, and I think there's some flashback back here to what happened in 2021. Uh, that was the last major outage we saw across some of those meta platforms. That lasted six hours, certainly hoping not. That's not the case right now. But um, a lot of frustrated users, because you know how much time people spend on social media.
Absolutely. And obviously not just social media, but also on WhatsApp, which is also part of Meta's suite of offerings as well. Was, tr- was trying to message some of my family in England and Ghana as well. Not those messages not going through as well. But as you look on Down Detector, which is really a self-reporting website where some of this was sort of first alerted. Facebook, Instagram, Facebook Messenger. Also seeing some people looking at some outages potentially for YouTube and Google Play as well. So continuing to track this this global outage here and hopefully hopefully it won't be out for as long as you mentioned last time for over the six hours. There we are. Even more connected than ever before. And especially when you have what's becoming something of an everything app, uh, certainly doesn't help when everything sort of goes down at the same time. All right, well, do stay with us. Up next, it's been a record-breaking year for markets so far, but is there even more room to run? We speak to a strategist to find out after the break. Gold prices are on the rise after hitting its highest level ever this week, rising above $2,100. Now, this comes as traders bet the Fed will start cutting rates in June. To break this down for us, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Inez Ferre. Inez, what are you tracking? Yeah, Rochelle, and gold really flirting with these new highs. April contracts yesterday settled at a record, headed for another record settlement today. And if you take a look, gold futures here, you can see this high of 2150 
And right now we're just above 2,136 per ounce. Now, when adjusted for inflation, gold hit highs back in the 80s. That would be the equivalent to around $3,200 today. But let me just pull up a chart here so you can see where we have been with gold uh, for the last uh, couple of months here. So we have seen that gold has been above the 2000 level range, just above that psychological range. And with higher rates, we have seen sort of resistance around this level, but the market is expecting rates to be lower because historically gold shines in times of uncertainty when there's geopolitical tensions and when the interest rates are headed down. Also, a lower dollar tends to lift gold prices up. Gold has been holding up pretty steady. And when you look at where the Fed's fund rate is, the market is anticipating some rate cuts this year, as you mentioned, in June. Also want to mention that central banks have really been loading up on gold. So that is driving up demand. Now, some analysts are predicting 2,500 in the next uh, 12 months. One of the risks, though, for gold going higher is that if the jobs report this Friday comes in hotter than expected, that would then mean that the Federal Reserve could postpone interest rate cuts even longer, guys. Yeah, one of those good news could be potentially bad news for the market. Inez Ferre, as always, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, the NASDAQ and S&P 500 hitting all-time highs this year, helped in part by man magnificent seven stocks, which account for roughly 50% of the S&P gains in 2024. So how high can these stocks continue to go? Our next guest thinks the rally still has legs. To break this down for us, let's bring in Brett Ewing, First Franklin Chief Market Strategist. Uh, Brett, good to talk to you today. I, I want to start with sort of the, the, the base case that you have here, because you say that you're actually expecting four to five rate cuts from the Fed because you don't think the economy is going to be on really sound footing for much longer. Talk to me about what it is that you see in terms of the clouds that are forming around what looks to be a pretty, pretty resilient macro environment right now. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when you look at the data right now, it looks looks pretty strong. We're looking out forward. I think uh, some things that I think are going to occur over the next few months is in the CPI, the shelter component who has been just really stubborn and not rolling over the way we needed to. And that, that accounts for 36% of the CPI. But we believe you're going to see that come down over the coming months. And it's going to give the Fed a little bit of green light to move forward. Um, also, we're looking at softening the labor market. You know, this is a big week for jobs. We have jolts out tomorrow, and we have the jobs report this Friday. So it's going to tell and paint a picture for us what's going on there. We believe that the labor force is softening. I mean, continuing claims just hit 1.9 million. I think the jolts number is going to come in a little light tomorrow. So we'll see. And, and Brett, you put in your notes that you believe the rally still has legs as most professional investors remain too defensive. If this is what it looks like when they're too defensive, what do we expect to see then happening in the next few months? Well, I mean, we're looking at some of the hedge fund positioning. There's a lot of uh, positioning right there where they're kind of still in the value uh, area and not fully exposed into some of the growth areas. And I think I think that this trend could continue for a while. You know, one of the areas, though, that I don't think the market is really positioned for is probably our favorite ask, ask, asset class going forward, which is small cap stocks. And when you're ever once that first rate cut hits, that's usually one of the top performing asset classes for years following that first rate cut. So any particular names you want to throw out there that you think maybe investors should be looking at if it does, in fact, come down to, as you have pointed out, four to five rate cuts? Well, I think investors, depending on their portfolio, without going into individual names, I think you can play small and mid-cap stocks through, you know, ETFs. I think that's a good way, index mutual funds. But if your portfolio, I think today is one of the, the greatest opportunities to get in that space. On a relative PE, it's one of the cheapest entry points we've seen in almost 20 years. Um, again, we think that we're gonna have rate cuts at a pretty moderate to slow pace, which is healthy for stock markets, going back and looking at history. 
And we believe once those rates cuts start happening, we believe that the small cap and mid cap areas are going to run the strongest. And Brent, I have to ask you about areas that you're staying away from. You've got home builders as one of the areas. Talk us through that and perhaps any others, any other sectors that you're steering clear on. Well, we believe the home builders have had their incredible run, um, no doubt about it. But we believe that mortgage rates will decline over the coming 12 months. Now, what our theory is, is that inventory or, or competition to new home builders will increase. And so as that inventory rises, um, we believe that there's a lot of pent up demand with people that haven't been able to move because of their mortgage lock scenario. So we think transactions pick up and it's gonna cause competition for the home builders going forward. We'll certainly continue to track that. Appreciate you joining us with your insights. Brett Ewing, First Franklin Chief Market Strategist. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, coming up, we'll be looking at the auto space from a new Dodge announcement to the EV race. More of that after the break. Dodge unveiling what it's calling the world's first EV muscle car, the Dodge Charger Daytona. Let's get to Yahoo Finance's Price of Romanian, who's got all the details for us and what this means for Dodge. Interesting timing here, Price. Yeah, Rochelle, you know, Dodge revealed this, the Daytona 
uh, Charger uh, prototype or, or concept car a couple years ago, and they said back then that this would only be an EV muscle car. We're gonna go EV all the way. That's the future of muscle cars. And here we have the the new the new Daytona Charger here, um, the Dodge Charger Daytona. Excuse me. Uh, two powertrains here. It's gonna have uh, all-wheel drive standard, but then also the, uh, a Scat Pack version and an RT version, depending on the power level that you want. Uh, also, it's a distinctive. They're calling it an R wing, which is a basically basically a, a little. Sl uh, uh, a flap in the front hood where air can go through the, the grill, go over the front hood and kind of give you more aerodynamic uh, kind of element there. But yeah, the big surprise, which I caught, what, what I was surprised by was they introduced two gas powered versions of these cars. Not, they were not expected to do that, but there were some ports out there saying that they would. And the two gas powered cars are, are, char, are powered by two, v, or two six cylinder engines. Uh, a little bit of a surprise there for Dodge to kind of come out with two versions of this car. So what do you think uh, drove that announcement? I mean, as you say, you know, so much of uh, the focus has been on EVs. Why introduce the gas-powered cars now? You know, it seems like could they have been thinking about the fact that the, the EV demand story has been changing here in this country and the car is a very popular car, or the original Charger and the original Challenger, uh, maybe they thought better to have kind of two different versions for two different audiences. But I have to imagine, Akiko, that you can't actually plan for that you know, without spending billions of dollars, right, a, a couple of years ago. You couldn't have just pivoted in the last few months. So I think that Dodge always had that in mind, potentially. They just didn't tell people. And I think there's people that bought the last generation Challenger and Charger thinking that those are the last gas-powered cars, and now they're saying, wait, what do you mean? There's gonna be new gas-powered Chargers and Challengers? Like, it's kind of a, maybe, uh, to their fans, a little bit disingenuous, but we'll see what happens. Okay, we'll continue to watch that demand there. Pras Supermania, as always, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, shares of Chinese EV maker Neo uh, moving after net losses widened in the fourth quarter. You see it up about uh, 2 percent here. The fourth quarter that led uh, that led to a $2.9 billion deficit for the year's increased competition led to aggressive price cutting in the world's largest EV market. Our next guest says American car makers stand to lose big in a head to head competition with Chinese EV makers with companies like BYD. In his words, outmaneuvering the big three on price and scale. Let's bring in Robinson Meyer. He's Heatmap founding executive editor to discuss more. Robinson, it feels like a good segue that Praz was talking about the introduction of these gas-powered cars from Dodge because you kind of highlight that in an op-ed in the New York Times saying specifically that the commitment hasn't been all in on EVs, if you will, from the big three. That's right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. So, yeah, exactly. I think the... What we've seen over the past few years is that GM and Ford have plotted aggressive EV transitions. And then through a combination of U.S. demand reasons and also just an institutional failure to execute, they have really struggled to actually get consumers to buy the cars and to turn their you know, upstart EV sector uh, segments, their, this EV parts of the company, into money makers. You know, e Ford as of last quarter, was still losing about $65,000 for every electric vehicle that it sold. And so, Robinson, with that in mind, a lot of people looking at what's happening with the Chinese EV space, because they really have gone all in with this and that commitment. But unlike when we saw uh, a greater pr uh, proliferation of Japanese and Korean automakers come into the fray, now we're in the time of connected vehicles, which adds another wrinkle. Mm -hmm. So not just price, but now national security as well. How does that sort of muddy the waters or perhaps change the dynamics here? Yeah, of course. So I think what the Biden administration is looking at here is two things. You know, of course, the over the past two years, the big past few years, the big three, and it's really the big two, because what we used to call Chrysler, now Stellantis, is much more of a global company. They have a European headquarters. We talk about the big three's EV troubles. It is a story mostly about Ford and GM. And over the past few years, they've really focused on this SUV and crossover segment. That's where almost all their profit comes from. And so for the Biden administration, they're looking at these two companies and they're saying, uh, they're, you know, these two companies are extremely politically important in the US and they're failing to um, transition to EVs. Okay. And so to get to your question, um, what we've seen from the Biden administration is they've called out this connected aspect of Chinese vehicles, the fact that Chinese vehicles and really all cars now, but because China is in a different geopolitical situation with the US than say Japan or Korea or Germany, um, because cars are so connected to the web all the time, because they're covered in, in, in sensors, because they're covered in cameras, as Biden said in a recent statement, they're basically smartphones on wheels. Um, because they're so connected, they pose security risks that 
normal cars, the conventional cars, you know, the Camrys and Civics of the 80s and 90s don't. And we, we've seen the Biden administration in the past week announce a series of actions that on the one hand are meant to address this connected aspect of Chinese cars. And on the other hand, I think more broadly are from a political lens, maybe meant to keep Chinese cars out of the US market for longer because of the risk they pose to the big three. Uh, Robinson, e even though we're talking, you know, so much about the U.S. market, um, the reality is Western car makers, at least, are already going head to head um, with these Chinese car makers in markets like Europe. You know, South America is a big battleground now. Uh, we had a chance to speak with Stella Lee, who's the um, executive VP at BYD. I want you to listen to what she had to say about the protection that trade restrictions essentially create for some of these car makers. So like a, a lot of OEM brand here, if they don't participate in the global competition to be better, they will be out. And the, the trade protection will not help you. I never believe like a trade protection will help any company. Yeah, because if you see the who are the winner, is the company who really change to get all technology will, will be the final winner. As a reminder, of course, any Chinese car import coming into the U.S. Um, is subject to 25 percent or, or a little more than that um, in terms of a tariff. We've heard the likes of Elon Musk, right, say essentially if you get rid of these, other car makers are going to be demolished. The competition will be demolished. Um, how do you see this? Is that really the, the, the one thing that's, that's keeping Chinese car makers from really capturing the global market here? Well, I think that, first of all, Chinese car makers are already plunging ahead in a lot of global markets. So BYD, for instance, is a great example. It's open factories in Brazil, Thailand, um, Hungary, Uzbekistan, in addition to the uh, 3 million cars per year capacity that it already operates in China. Um, it's looking at opening a factory in Mexico, which would, of course, then make those cars subject to USMCA free trade provisions. Um, What's keeping it out of the U.S. right now is just the fact that it hasn't really tried to sell cars in the U.S. It does sell buses here. Um, more broadly, what we're seeing is that auto markets, especially European auto markets, are having a very hard time figuring out exactly how to craft uh, trade protections that, on the one hand, keep this deluge of very cheap cars from China out of their domestic markets, protecting their local automakers. And on the other hand, exactly as Ms. Lee said, um, uh, keeping that, that keep local automakers, you know, their domestic automakers, whether that's Volkswagen or Peugeot in Europe or Ford and GM here in the US, competitive and like at the cutting edge of vehicle technology. And I don't think any company or country has solved this problem yet, but I think this is a major policy question going forward, specifically for the United States and Europe, as they try to figure out how do we keep these automakers alive during what is basically a second China shock in the automotive sector, while at the same time making sure that these automakers can stay competitive, that they can keep up with Chinese companies who often are ahead of them specifically on questions of battery chemistry uh, and software integration with the vehicle. And Robinson, when you think of the, the UAW strike, some of the concessions that were made there and the cost as well as the retreat that we're seeing from some of these um, US car makers then, what is going to help the US stay competitive in the EV space as, as Chinese and European car makers who are really hyper-focused on this in other parts of the world are stepping up their game? So I think, first of all, it's kind of an interesting situation here in the U.S. because in some ways we really have two different car industries. We have Ford, GM, and Stellantis up north in the old Rust Belt who are subject to UAW provisions. And then we have a second car industry down in the Sun Belt, you know, what some people are starting to call the Battery Belt, which is where a lot of the global automakers operate manufacturing and also where there is a lot of the actual battery manu you know, manuf manufacturing capacity and cathode manufacturing capacity, all the kind of new economy stuff is going in there. And those are, of course, in right-to-work states. They're less unionized. The UAW is trying to make a beachhead there. But for now, those automakers will have lower labor costs. So first of all, there's just some competition here in the U.S. What I call for in my New York Times op-ed is that the Biden administration, as it seeks to blunt the effect of this initial surge of Chinese vehicles around the world, 
suggest to automakers here that they need to do everything they can to stay competitive. They need to go open factories, you know, near BYD factories and see what kind of technologies they can learn. They need to um, suggest to, be, to American automakers, as they suggested in the 80s, that whatever trade protections or export limits they put in place now will not be permanent. And Ford and GM need to start planning to compete with BYD and NIO and Geely and other Chinese automakers for the long term, that they can't just plan on kind of operating in the American market, which will increasingly become like an automotive backwater if we just partition ourselves off from the world. They need to go out, they need to start selling more cars internationally. They need to diversify beyond the SUVs and crossovers and pickups that kind of drive their profit right now. And they need to learn everything they can from these Chinese upstarts so that in the 2030s and 2040s, they're ready to compete in the global markets. Indeed, and to meet some of those climate targets as well. I appreciate you yes. taking the time to join us this morning. <laughs> well, Vincent Meyer, Heat Map founding executive editor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, China is setting its official growth target around 5% for the year, projecting a confident front to global investors. However, China's premier is acknowledging the GDP target will, quote, not be an easy reach, alluding to potentially more government intervention as the country works to combat a slew of issues such as a property crisis, deflation and debt woes. And Akiko, President Xi Jinping does seem to be a little bit reluctant to, to really take a stronger hand when it comes to stimulus, because we, as we look at some of the market reaction, they don't seem to be that convinced that enough is being done to combat what we're seeing, especially with deflation in China. Yeah, I mean, with that said, we did get some announcements um, from the legislative session that's been playing out over in Beijing about additional measures um, the government's likely to take, uh, looking specifically at urban unemployment, targeting 12 million new urban jobs. But what's interesting to me is this part about foreign direct investment. So the premier over in China saying that China would drop more restrictions on FDI into the country and then scrap the ceiling that's been placed on foreign investment into the manufacturing sector. And I mention this because you have to wonder how, you know, by dropping some of those restrictions, does that necessarily mean that foreign investment is going to start to flow into China again? Last year, we had a three-year low. We've heard, you know, from so many business leaders who've talked about this reluctance to invest in the Chinese market. So that's going to be an interesting, to wa interesting one to watch, even if the Chinese premier is saying this is one of those stimulative, stimulative measures we're hoping to push forward. And it's true. And, and having that GDP target of 5%, given that this is not the same uh, economy that we're used to seeing here, obviously consumer demand has slowed down in China. And you've seen a lot of companies with multinational exposure to China really starting to diversify away from the country. Obviously, when you think of your, your apples, for example, but still obviously a, a stronghold here in China. But some, some caution, at least when you look at some of the geopolitical issues that are making diversification away from China still looking attractive as well, Akika. Yeah, and they've got so many domestic challenges, whether it is the collapse that we've seen in the property market, youth unemployment rate, um, that has still remained elevated despite some of that coming down as well. So a lot to watch there. Obviously, um, it is the se world's second largest economy and certainly going to be a big impact regardless of what they do into the U.S. as well. Well, coming up on the other side, taking off into the space race, we're going to speak to the CEO of Rocket Lab on how his company is taking on SpaceX. That conversation is coming up next.
President Biden cracking down on what he calls unfair and illegal pricing from corporations with the launch of a new task force today, which will be led by the FTC and the Department of Justice. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joins us <coughs> with those details. This, this new strike force, what do we know about it so far? Yeah, Biden's been on this campaign for a while. I mean, he used to be calling it junk fees, uh, and they've been trying to just tackle the annoyances that a lot of consumers, I mean, pr practically all of us are familiar with. Um, so this is now seems to be going into overdrive. I mean, obviously, this is a campaign pitch for Biden. He wants uh, Americans to know he's on their side. So one of the things they're coming out of the gate saying they're going to go after is credit card late fees. They're there's a new rule now from the Biden administration that will cap credit card late fees at $8 per month. Uh, those can sometimes run uh, $25 or $30 per month. Um, now, that is going to get a, a legal challenge. And when Biden says some of these fees are illegal, I think it's going to be up to courts to figure that out. But uh, Biden is, I, I think, just going to be banging this drum uh, for the rest of the campaign, if, at least if they think this gets, them some, uh, gets him some traction among voters. Uh, I mean, it sounds like something that ha ought to have populist appeal to voters. But guys, the, the problem uh, Biden keeps running into is he does things that actually benefit people and nobody notices. So so how, you know, Biden's main challenge may be, I guess, two challenges. One, uh, getting these through the courts. And number two, getting people to notice that he's actually trying to do something on their side. At any rate, anybody who watches the State of the Union speech uh, this coming Thursday is doubtless going to hear about this. OK, I was going to say, we'll be looking for any additional details coming through from that State of the Union. Thanks so much for that, Rick. Bye, guys. Her Rocket Lab shares have had a bit of a difficult start to 2024, down more than 20 percent so far this year. The space company is looking to make its mark on the industry with the launch of its first neutron rocket, which it originally unveiled plans of back in 2021. Let's bring in Peter back. He is the Rocket Lab CEO. And Peter, uh, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, there's so much attention on this neutron launch, which is, of course, the medium lift uh, rocket that you're looking to launch by the end of the year. But um, I want to get your reaction to a report that came out from TechCrunch, which, by the way, is owned by our uh, parent company, Apollo, as well, um, sort of suggesting, you know, they cited an internal congressional memo that said Rocket Lab essentially overstated its ability to be able to deliver on this launch by the end of this year, saying essentially December 15th was put as the target date so you could be eligible for these lucrative contracts that come through from the Space Force. I want to get your reaction to that. How much credence do we put in that? And how credible is that launch target December 15th? Yeah, well, thanks very much. Um, but look, uh, I think, um, you know, clearly we've got the attention of our competitors um, and, um, you know, I take a, take that as a feather in our cap uh, that, uh, you know, you know, people start throwing mud at you. So, um, look, we're, we're working super hard to, to try and get the vehicle to the pad by the end of the year. I think everybody knows that. Uh, but we're also being, being realistic that it is a launch vehicle and it's a launch vehicle program. And, um, you know, if everything goes well, we'll get it to the pad. And if we, we have issues along the way, then um, then, then we won't. But, um, you know, at the moment, we have a, a schedule that says we can get it to the pad. So until until that changes, we're not waving the white flag. So let's talk about some of those challenges in getting there. Um, you've highlighted in the most re recent earnings call about this new engine that will be used in Neutron. That's kind of the next step, getting the test going on that. What does that timeline look like? You mentioned potentially end of March. Is that schedule still on track? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, engines are typically the, the long pole and the tent on any new launch vehicle development. Um, we've done everything we can to, to try and uh, remove the, you know, the, you know the, the stress out of the engine and the engine program. So, you know, we'll, we'll look to have something on the test stand, um, yeah, hopefully by the end of March. And then um, that's that's when the rubber hits the road as we'll see, we'll see how, um, how the engine performs and... Uh, we're kind of at that, that honeymoon phase right now where we have a lot of hardware uh, all coming to fruition. You know, we've completed all our avionics and hardware in the loop and a lot of the, the software and testing. So now's that time when all that hardware comes together and, um, and we, you know, we get to see what we've really got. 
It's been pretty incredible to, to see the ramp up in just commercial activity um, within the space sector. Um, Rocket Lab itself trying to own sort of that full stack from satellite to launch. You've got Electron already, you know, really sort of humming along. Neutron, this medium lift rocket is next. Other offerings in the works as well. Um, what does the future of Rocket Lab look like? Mm. Yeah, no, it's it's funny because uh, everybody knows us for our electron launch vehicle. You know, it's the second most frequently launched rocket behind SpaceX, fourth most frequently launched rocket in the entire world, in fact. Um, so, not surprisingly, everybody knows us for for our for our rocket programs. But actually, two thirds of our revenue come from our space systems division, and you know, we we have over forty satellites in build, uh, some for uh, very important national security missions uh, like the SDA. Uh, and, uh, you know, and some for uh, commercial constellations. Then we have a merchant supply business of space components that, uh, that you know, it's far reaching across the entire industry. In fact, you know, 37% of everything that was launched last year had a Rocket Lab logo on it somewhere. So like I say, we're, we're well known for our rockets, but, you know, we, uh, we, we pride ourselves on being a one-stop space shop. So, uh, we do everything from uh, the initial design and supply of components through to actually building the satellites, through the launching of the satellites. And then just yesterday, we uh, we had an event for uh, the methane set where we actually operate uh, that satellite for customers as well. So really an end-to-end -end space company. Uh, Peter, you mentioned, you know, you have the second most launches behind SpaceX. Um, last I saw, I mean, SpaceX is launching rockets, what, once every three days or something, if you kind of break down the, the annual number. Um, what's the target for Rocket Lab or, or how long until you get to that kind of frequency? Yeah, so Electron this year will launch around about 22 times. Um, so, you know, that's, a, that's a, a mark step up from last year, which is about 10 times. So we have, uh, we have a rocket on the pad sort of every, every couple of weeks. Um, so far, when you look at sort of the breakdown of the space industry, so much of it has been about rockets and satellite communications. Um, we recently saw the successful reentry of um, Varda's space capsule, which, of course, uh, Rocket Lab designed. Uh, this is a capsule, for those who haven't been following, that allows for space manufacturing, a lot of that in pharmaceuticals as mm. well. And I wonder when you think about the future of this industry, does it get to yeah. a point where it's not just about being a rocket company, you know, sort of an aerospace company that, in other words, pharmaceuticals, you know, health and wellness, everybody will have to somehow participate in it because it is going to be at that intersection. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, we see, um, you know, businesses that, that typically haven't had anything to do with space becoming, you know, quite reliant on it. And, you know, our, our view that the large successful space companies of the future are not going to be solely a launch company or solely a satellite manufacturing company because the sheer power of when you combine those two elements together i mean space is a, a, a giant engineering compromise if you will so if you can if you can you know both add launch and space systems together then uh, you can provide services that, that that are far superior than than you know if you're doing it in a more traditional sense and we see more and more companies come to us and they have no knowledge of the space industry, nor do they want to, uh, but they just want a service. Um, and I think that's where it all boils down to. So the reason why we're pushing so hard on Neutron is, you know, 50% of it is that, look, we, we absolutely think there needs to be uh, some more competition in the market um, in the medium launch area. And uh, secondly, you know, we want to provide services and having your own ride to space or having the keys to space is critical to that. Peter Beck, Rocket Lab CEO, always good to talk to you. Really appreciate you uh, joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks. All your markets action straight ahead. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
your streaming bill could get a lot more expensive. A new sports streaming service from Disney's ESPN, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Fox will be priced on the higher end of estimates, according to Fox CEO Lachlan Murdoch. Just how high could this bundle be priced? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance senior reporter Ali Canal. Ali, what kind of number are we talking about? Well, Akiko, unfortunately, the skinny bundle is not going to be so skinny when it comes to our wallets there. But Wall Street has been projecting around 40 to 50 bucks a month for this service. So it seems like given these comments, we're going to be priced on the higher end right around $50 for this joint venture. It is expected to launch later this fall. So I do think we're going to receive an official confirmation on pricing sooner rather than later. But we also received a projection when it comes to subscribers. Lachlan Murdoch estimates estimating that subscribers are expected to hit $5 billion by the year 2029. Now, the pitch here is that this service appeals to the cord cutters and the cord nevers. He estimated that 50 to 60 million Americans are not currently subscribed to the cable bundle and that a large portion of that population is going to be attracted to this type of offering there. One risk, though, that's really uh, clouding the outlook is the potential for regulatory approval. We did hear last month from Fubo TV. It filed an antitrust lawsuit against Fox, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Disney, those three companies behind the joint venture, citing anti-competitive behavior. But Lachlan Murdoch yesterday said he's not concerned at all when it comes to regulatory approval. He said, quote, when you look at this service, it's pro-consumer, it's pro-competition, it's focused on a cohort of people on a segment that's not served at all with sports content. So that's going to be a big question mark that we'll be following closely, whether or not this does receive the approval. And also, how many subscribers is this service going to have when you're asking people to pay for yet another streaming service, considering we have so many options on the market right now. And sports in particular, it's been a very hot market. I think this is why these companies were attracted to an offer like this. But, you know, we'll have to see when push comes to shove. And a big part of that question mark is going to be the pricing point. Indeed. Uh, another fee to add here. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, Ali Canal, thanks so much for breaking all of that down for us. Let's get you a quick check of the markets right now. Looking at the Dow currently off more than 300 points at the moment, seeing a broad sell off across the board here. The Dow currently down three, about 320 points, S&P down over 1%. Tech heavy Nasdaq taking the biggest hit down about 280 points. Seeing those declines on that Apple uh, report from CounterPoint Research of iPhone sales plunging in China the first six weeks of 2024. Looking at Amazon, Microsoft also down around 2% and Tesla off nearly 5%. So we'll continue to track those moves for you. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akutha alongside Akiko Fujita. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.